Half a Lifetime Ago, Part Two. Susan and Michael were to be married in April. He had already gone to take possession of his new farm three or four miles away from New Nook, but that is neighbouring, according to the acceptation of the word in that thinly populated district, when Michael Dixon fell ill. He came home one evening, complaining of headache and pains in his limbs, but seemed to loathe the posset which Susan prepared for him, the treacle posset which was the homely country remedy against an incipient cold. He took to his bed with a sensation of exceeding weariness, and an odd, unusual, looking back to the days of his youth, when he was a lad living with his parents in this very house. The next morning he had forgotten all his life since then, and did not know his own children, crying like a newly weaned baby for his mother to come and soothe away his terrible pain. The doctor from Coniston said it was the typhus fever, and warned Susan of its infectious character, and shook his head over his patient. There were no friends near to come and share her anxiety only good kind old peggy who was faithfulness itself and one or two labourers wives who would fain have helped her had not their hands been tied by their responsibility to their own families but somehow susan neither feared nor flagged as for fear indeed she had no time to give way to it for every energy of both body and mind was required besides the young have had too little experience of the danger of infection to dread it much she did indeed wish from time to time that michael had been at home to have taken willie over to his father's at high back but then again the lad was docile and useful to her and his fecklessness in many things might make him harshly treated by strangers so perhaps it was as well that michael was away at appleby fair or even beyond that gone into yorkshire after horses her father grew worse and the doctor insisted on sending over a nurse from coniston not a professed nurse coniston could not have supported such a one but a widow who was ready to go where the doctor sent her for the sake of the payment when she came susan suddenly gave way she was felled by the fever herself and lay unconscious for long weeks her consciousness returned to her one spring afternoon early spring april her wedding month there was a little fire burning in the small corner grate and the flickering of the blaze was enough for her to notice in her weak state she felt that there was some one sitting on the window side of her bed behind the curtain but she did not care to know who it was it was even too great a trouble for her languid mind to consider who it was likely to be. She would rather shut her eyes and melt off again into the gentle luxury of sleep. The next time she wakened, the Coniston nurse perceived her movement and made her a cup of tea, which she drank with eager relish, but still they did not speak, and once more Susan lay motionless, not asleep but strangely pleasantly conscious of all the small chamber and household sounds the fall of a cinder on the hearth the fitful singing of the half-empty cattle the cattle tramping out to the field again after they had been milked the aged step on the creaking stair old peggy's as she knew it came to her door it stopped the person outside listened for a moment and then lifted the wooden latch and looked in the watcher by the bedside arose and went to her. Susan would have been glad to see Peggy's face once more, but was far too weak to turn, so she lay and listened. "'How is she?' whispered one trembling, aged voice. "'Better,' replied the other. "'She's been awake and had a cup of tea. She'll do now.' "'Has she asked after him?' "'Hush. No.' She has not spoken a word. Poor lass, poor lass. The door was shut. A weak feeling of sorrow and self-pity came over Susan. What was wrong? Whom had she loved? And dawning, 
dawning slowly rose the sun of her former life and all particulars were made distinct to her she felt that some sorrow was coming to her and cried over it before she knew what it was or had strength enough to ask in the dead of night and she had never slept again she softly called to the watcher and asked who who what replied the woman with a conscious affright ill veiled by a poor assumption of ease lie still there's a darling and go to sleep sleeps better for you than all the doctor's stuff who repeated susan something is wrong who oh dear said the woman there's nothing wrong willie has taken the turn and is doing nicely father well he's all right now she answered looking another way as if seeking for something then it's michael oh me oh me she set up a succession of weak plaintive hysterical cries before the nurse could pacify her by declaring that michael had been at the house not three hours before to ask after her and looked as well and as hearty as ever man did and you heard of no harm to him since inquired susan bless the lass no for sure i ne'er heard his name named since i saw him go out of the yard as stout a man as ever trod shoe leather it was well as the nurse said afterwards to peggy that susan had been so easily pacified by the equivocating answer in respect to her father if she had pressed the questions home in his case as she did in michael's she would have learnt that he was dead and buried more than a month before it was well too that in her weak state of convalescence which lasted long after this first day of consciousness her perceptions were not sharp enough to observe the sad change that had taken place in willie his bodily strength returned his appetite was something enormous but his eyes wandered continually his regard could not be arrested his speech became slow impeded and incoherent people began to say that the fever had taken away the little wit willie dixon had ever possessed and that they feared that he would end in being a natural as they called an idiot in the dales the habitual affection and obedience to susan lasted longer than any other feeling that the boy had had previous to his illness and perhaps this made her be the last to perceive what every one else had long anticipated she felt the awakening rude when it did come it was in this wise one june evening she sat out of doors under the yew tree knitting she was pale still from her recent illness and her languor joined to the fact of her black dress made her look more than usually interesting she was no longer the buoyant self-sufficient susan equal to every occasion the men were bringing in the cows to be milked and michael was about in the yard giving orders and directions with somewhat of the air of a master for the farm belonged of right to willie and susan had succeeded to the guardianship of her brother michael and she were to be married as soon as she was strong enough so perhaps his authoritative manner was justified but the labourers did not like it although they said little they remembered him a stripling on the farm knowing far less than they did and often glad to shelter his ignorance of all agricultural matters behind their superior knowledge they would have taken orders from susan with far more willingness nay willie himself might have commanded them and from the old hereditary feeling towards the owners of land they would have obeyed him with far greater cordiality then than they now showed to michael but susan was tired with even three rounds of knitting and seemed not to notice or to care how things went on around her and willie poor willie there he stood lounging against the door sill enormously grown and developed to be sure but with restless eyes and ever open mouth and every now and then setting up a strange kind of howling cry 
and then smiling vacantly to himself at the sound he had made as the two old labourers passed him they looked at each other ominously and shook their heads willie darling said susan don't make that noise it makes my head ache she spoke feebly and willie did not seem to hear at any rate he continued his howl from time to time hold thy noise wilt thou said michael roughly as he passed near him and threatening him with his fist susan's back was turned to the pair the expression of willie's face changed from vacancy to fear and he came shambling up to susan and put her arm round him and as if protected by that shelter he began making faces at michael susan saw what was going on and as if now first struck by the strangeness of her brother's manner she looked anxiously at michael for an explanation michael was irritated at willie's defiance of him and did not mince the matter it's just that the fever has left him silly he never was as wise as other folk and now i doubt if he will ever get right susan did not speak but she went very pale and her lip quivered she looked long and wistfully at willie's face as he watched the motion of the ducks in the great stable pool he laughed softly to himself every now and then willie likes to see the ducks go overhead said susan instinctively adopting the form of speech she would have used to a young child willie boo willie boo he replied clapping his hands and avoiding her eye speak properly willie said susan making a strong effort at self-control and trying to arrest his attention you know who i am tell me my name she grasped his arm almost painfully tight to make him attend now he looked at her and for an instant a gleam of recognition quivered over his face but the exertion was evidently painful and he began to cry at the vainness of the effort to recall her name he hid his face upon her shoulder with the old affectionate trick of manner she put him gently away and went into the house into her own little bedroom she locked the door and did not reply at all to michael's calls for her hardly spoke to old peggy who tried to tempt her out to receive some homely sympathy and through the open casement there still came the idiotic sound of willie boo willie boo half a lifetime ago part three after the stun of the blow came the realization of the consequences susan would sit for hours trying patiently to recall and piece together fragments of recollection and consciousness in her brother's mind she would let him go and pursue some senseless bit of play and wait until she could catch his eye or his attention again when she would resume her self-imposed task michael complained that she never had a word for him or a minute of time to spend with him now but she only said she must try while there was yet a chance to bring back her brother's lost wits as for marriage in this state of uncertainty she had no heart to think of it then michael stormed and absented himself for two or three days but it was of no use when he came back he saw that she had been crying till her eyes were all swollen up and he gathered from peggy's scoldings which she did not spare him that susan had eaten nothing since he went away but she was as inflexible as ever not just yet only not just yet and don't say again that i do not love you said she suddenly hiding herself in his arms and so matters went on through august the crop of oats was gathered in the wheat field was not ready as yet when one fine day michael drove up in a borrowed chandry and offered to take willie a ride his manner when susan asked him where he was going to was rather confused but the answer was straight and clear enough he had business in ambleside he would never lose sight of the lad and have him back safe and sound before dark so susan let him go before night they were home again willie in high delight 
at a little rattling paper windmill that Michael had bought for him in the street, and striving to imitate this new sound with perpetual buzzings. Michael, too, looked pleased. Susan knew the look, although afterwards she remembered that he had tried to veil it from her, and had assumed a grave appearance of sorrow whenever he caught her eye. He put up his horse, for, although he had three miles further to go, the moon was up, the bonny harvest moon, and he did not care how late he had to drive on such a road by such a light. After the supper which Susan had prepared for the travellers was over, Peggy went upstairs to see Willie safe in bed, for he had to have the same care taken of him that a little child of four years old requires. Michael drew near to Susan. Susan, said he, I took Will to see Dr. Preston at Kendall. He's the first doctor in the county. I thought it were better for us, for you, to know at once what chance there were for him. Well, said Susan, looking eagerly up. She saw the same strange glance of satisfaction, the same instant change to apparent regret and pain. What did he say? she said. Speak, can't you? He said he would never get better of his weakness. Never? No, never. It's a long word, and hard to bear, and there's worse to come, dearest. The doctor thinks he will get badder from year to year, and he said, if he was us, you, he would send him off in time to Lancaster Asylum. They've ways there, both of keeping such people in order and making them happy. I only tell you what he said, continued he, seeing the gathering storm in her face. There was no harm in his saying it, she replied with great self-constraint, forcing herself to speak coldly instead of angrily. Folk is welcome to their opinions. They sat silent for a minute or two, her breast heaving with suppressed feeling. He's counted a very clever man, said Michael at length. He may be. He's none of my clever men, nor am I going to be guided by him, whatever he may think and I don't thank them that went and took my poor lad to have such harsh notions formed about him. If I'd been there, I could have called out the sense that is in him. Well, I'll not say more to-night, Susan. You're not taking it rightly, and I'd best be gone, and leave you to think it over. I'll not deny they are hard words to hear, but there's sense in them, as I take it, and I reckon you'll have to come to em. Anyhow, it's a bad way of thanking me for my pains, and I don't take it well in you, Susan, said he, getting up as if offended. Michael, I'm beside myself with sorrow. Don't blame me if I speak sharp. He and me is the only ones, you see, and Mother did so charge me to have a care of him. And this is what he's come to, poor little chap. She began to cry, and Michael to comfort her with caresses. Don't, said she, it's no use trying to make me forget poor Willie is a natural. I could hate myself for being happy with you, even for just a little minute. Go away and leave me to face it out. And you'll think it over, Susan, and remember what the doctor says. I can't forget it, said she. She meant she could not forget what the doctor had said about the hopelessness of her brother's case. Michael had referred to the plan of sending Willie away to an asylum, or madhouse, as they were called in that day and place. The idea had been gathering force in Michael's mind for some time. He had talked it over with his father, and secretly rejoiced over the possession of the farm and land, which would then be his, in fact, if not in law, by right of his wife. He had always considered the good penny her father could give her in his catalogue of Susan's charms and attractions. But of late he had grown to esteem her as the heiress of Yu Nook. He too should have land like his brother, land to possess, to cultivate, to make profit from, to bequeath. For some time he had wondered that Susan had been so much absorbed in Willie's present, that she had never seemed to look forward to his future state. Michael had long felt the boy to be a trouble, 
but of late he had absolutely loathed him his gibbering his uncouth gestures his loose shambling gait all irritated michael inexpressibly he did not come near the yew nook for a couple of days he thought that he would leave her time to become anxious to see him and reconciled to his plan they were strange lonely days to susan they were the first she had spent face to face with the sorrows that had turned her from a girl into a woman for hitherto michael had never let twenty-four hours pass by without coming to see her since she had had the fever now that he was absent it seemed as though some cause of irritation was removed from will who was much more gentle and tractable than he had been for many weeks susan thought that she observed him making efforts at her bidding and there was something piteous in the way in which he crept up to her and looked wistfully in her face as if asking her to restore him the faculties that he felt to be wanting i never will let thee go lad never there's no knowing where they would take thee to or what they would do with thee as it says in the bible naught but death shall part thee and me the countryside was full in those days of stories of the brutal treatment offered to the insane stories that were in fact but too well founded and the truth of one of which would only have been a sufficient reason for the strong prejudice existing against all such places each succeeding hour that susan passed alone or with the poor affectionate lad for her sole companion served to deepen her solemn resolution never to part with him so when michael came he was annoyed and surprised by the calm way in which she spoke as if following dr preston's advice was utterly and entirely out of the question he had expected nothing less than a consent reluctant it might be but still a consent and he was extremely irritated he could have repressed his anger but he chose rather to give way to it thinking that he could thus best work on susan's affection so as to gain his point but somehow he overreached himself and now he was astonished in his turn at the passion of indignation that she burst into thou wilt not bide in the same house with him sayest thou there's no need for thy biding as far as i can tell there's solemn reason why i should bide with my own flesh and blood and keep to the word i pledged my mother on her deathbed but as for thee there's no tie that i know on to keep thee from going to america or botany bay this very night if that were thy inclination i will have no more of your threats to make me send my bairn away if thou marry me thou'll help me take charge of willie if thou doesn't choose to marry me on those terms why i can snap my fingers at thee never fear i'm not so far gone in love as that but i will not have thee if thou sayest it in such a hectoring way that willie must go out of the house and the house his own too before thou'lt set foot in it willie bides here and i bide with him thou hast maybe spoken a word too much said michael pale with rage if i am free as thou sayest to go to canada or botany bay i reckon i'm free to live where i like and that will not be with a natural who may turn into a madman some day for aught i know choose between him and me susie for i swear to thee thou shan't have both i have chosen said susan now perfectly composed and still whatever comes of it i bide with willie very well said michael trying to assume an equal composure of manner then i'll wish you a very good night he went out of the house door half expecting to be called back again but instead he heard a hasty step inside and a bolt drawn phew said he to himself i think i must leave my lady alone for a week or two and give her time to come to her senses she'll not find it so easy as she thinks to let me go so he went past the kitchen window in nonchalant style and was not seen again at eunuch for some weeks how did he pass the time for the first day or two he was unusually cross with all things and people that came athwart him 
then wheat harvest began and he was busy and exultant about his heavy crop then a man came from a distance to bid for the lease of his farm which by his father's advice had been offered for sale as he himself was so soon likely to remove to yu nook he had so little idea that susan really would remain firm to her determination that he at once began to haggle with the man who came after his farm showed him the crop just got in and managed skilfully enough to make a good bargain for himself of course the bargain had to be sealed at the public house and the companions he met with there soon became friends enough to tempt him into langdale where again he met with eleanor hebthwaite how did susan pass the time for the first day or so she was too angry and offended to cry she went about her household duties in a quick sharp jerking yet absent way shrinking one moment from will overwhelming him with remorseful caresses the next the third day of michael's absence she had the relief of a good fit of crying and after that she grew softer and more tender she felt how harshly she had spoken to him and remembered how angry she had been she made excuses for him it was no wonder she said to herself that he had been vexed with her and no wonder he would not give in when she had never tried to speak gently or to reason with him she was to blame and she would tell him so and tell him once again all that her mother had bade her be to willie and all the horrible stories she had heard about the madhouses and he would be on her side at once and so she watched for his coming intending to apologize as soon as ever she saw him she hurried over her household work in order to sit quietly at her sewing and hear the first distant sound of his well-known step or whistle but even the sound of her flying needle seemed too loud perhaps she was losing an exquisite instant of anticipation so she stopped sewing and looked longingly out through the geranium leaves in order that her eye might catch the first stir of the branches in the woody path by which he generally came now and then a bird might spring out of the covert otherwise the leaves were heavily still in the sultry weather of early autumn then she would take up her sewing and with a spasm of resolution she would determine that a certain task should be fulfilled before she would again allow herself the poignant luxury of expectation sick at heart was she when the evening closed in and the chances of that day diminished yet she stayed up longer than usual thinking that if he were coming if he were only passing along the distant road the sight of a light in the window might encourage him to make his appearance even at that late hour while seeing the house all darkened and shut up might quench any such intention very sick and weary at heart she went to bed too desolate and despairing to cry or make any moan but in the morning hope came afresh another day another chance and so it went on for weeks Peggy understood her young mistress's sorrow full well, and respected it by her silence on the subject. Willie seemed happier now that the irritation of Michael's presence was removed, for the poor idiot had a sort of antipathy to Michael, which was a kind of heart's echo to the repugnance in which the latter held him. Altogether, just at this time, Willie was the happiest of the three as susan went into coniston to sell her butter one saturday some inconsiderate person told her that she had seen michael hurst the night before i said inconsiderate but i might rather have said unobservant for any one who had spent half an hour in susan dixon's company might have seen that she disliked having any reference made to the subjects nearest her heart were they joyous or grievous now she went a little paler than usual and she had never recovered her colour since she had had the fever and tried to keep silence but an irrepressible pang forced out the question where at thomas applethwaite's in langdale they had a kind of harvest home and he were there among the young folk and very thick with nelly hebthwaite old thomas's niece 
Thou'lt have to look after him a bit, Susan. She neither smiled nor sighed. The neighbour who had been speaking to her was struck with the grey stillness of her face. Susan herself felt how well her self-command was obeyed by every little muscle, and said to herself in her Spartan manner, I can bear it without either wincing or blanching. She went home early, at a tearing, passionate pace, trampling and breaking through all obstacles of briar or bush. Willie was moping in her absence, hanging listlessly on the farmyard gate to watch for her. When he saw her, he set up one of his strange inarticulate cries, of which she was now learning the meaning, and came towards her with his loose galloping run, head and limbs all shaking and wagging with pleasant excitement. Suddenly she turned from him and burst into tears. She sat down on a stone by the wayside, not a hundred yards from home, and buried her face in her hands, and gave way to a passion of pent-up sorrow. So terrible and full of agony were her low cries, that the idiot stood by her aghast and silent, all his joy gone for the time, but not, like her joy, turned into ashes. Some thought struck him. Yes, the sight of her woe made him think, great as the exertion was. He ran and stumbled and shambled home, buzzing with his lips all the time. She never missed him. He came back in a trice, bringing with him his cherished paper windmill, bought on that fatal day when Michael had taken him into Kendal to have his doom of perpetual idiocy pronounced. He thrust it into Susan's face, her hands, her lap, regardless of the injury his frail plaything thereby received. He leapt before her to think how he had cured all heart sorrow, buzzing louder than ever. Susan looked up at him, and that glance of her sad eyes sobered him. He began to whimper, he knew not why, and she, now comforter in her turn, tried to soothe him by twirling his windmill. But it was broken, it made no noise, it would not go round. This seemed to afflict Susan more than him. She tried to make it right, although she saw the task was hopeless, and while she did so, the tears rained down unheeded from her bent head on the paper toy. It won't do, said she at last, it will never do again. And somehow she took the accident and her words as omens of the love that was broken, and that she feared could never be pieced together more. She rose up and took Willie's hand, and the two went slowly into the house. To her surprise, Michael Hurst sat in the house place. The house place is a sort of better kitchen where no cookery is done, but which is reserved for state occasions. Michael had gone in there because he was accompanied by his only sister, a woman older than himself who was well married beyond Keswick, and who now came for the first time to make acquaintance with Susan. Michael had primed his sister with his wishes regarding Will and the position in which he stood with Susan, and arriving at Eunook in the absence of the latter, he had not scrupled to conduct his sister into the guest room, as he held Mrs. Gale's worldly position in respect and admiration, and therefore wished her to be favourably impressed with all the signs of property which he was beginning to consider as Susan's greatest charms. He had secretly said to himself that if Eleanor Hepthwaite and susan dixon were equal in point of richness he would sooner have eleanor by far he had begun to consider susan as a termagant and when he thought of his intercourse with her recollections of her somewhat warm and hasty temper came far more readily to his mind than any remembrance of her generous loving nature and now she stood face to face with him her eyes tear-swollen her garments dusty and here and there torn in consequence of her rapid progress through the bushy bypaths. She did not make a favourable impression on the well-clad Mrs. Gale, dressed in her best silk gown, and therefore unusually susceptible to the appearance of another. Nor were Susan's manners gracious or cordial. How could they be, 
when she remembered what had passed between Michael and herself the last time they met, for her penitence had faded away under the daily disappointment of these last weary weeks. But she was hospitable in substance. She bade Peggy hurry on the kettle, and busied herself among the teacups, thankful that the presence of Mrs. Gale as a stranger would prevent the immediate recurrence to the one subject which she felt must be present in Michael's mind as well as in her own. But Mrs. Gale was withheld by no such feelings of delicacy. She had come ready primed with the case, and had undertaken to bring the girl to reason. There was no time to be lost. It had been prearranged between the brother and sister that he was to stroll out into the farmyard before his sister introduced the subject. But she was so confident in the success of her arguments that she must needs have the triumph of a victory as soon as possible, and, accordingly, she brought a hailstorm of good reasons to bear upon Susan. Susan did not reply for a long time. She was so indignant at this intermeddling of a stranger in the deep family sorrow and shame. Mrs. Gale thought she was gaining the day, and urged her arguments more pitilessly. Even Michael winced for Susan, and wondered at her silence. He shrunk out of sight and into the shadow, hoping that his sister might prevail, but annoyed at the hard way in which she kept putting the case. Suddenly Susan turned round from the occupation she had pretended to be engaged in, and said to him, in a low voice, which yet not only vibrated itself, but made its hearers thrill through all their obtuseness. Michael Hurst, does your sister speak truth, think you? Both women looked at him for his answer. Mrs. Gale without anxiety, for had she not said the very words they had spoken together before? Had she not used the very arguments that he himself had suggested? Susan, on the contrary, looked to his answer as settling her doom for life, and in the gloom of her eyes you might have read more despair than hope. He shuffled his position. He shuffled in his words. What is it you ask? My sister has said many things. I ask you, said Susan, trying to give a crystal clearness to both her expressions and her pronunciation, if, knowing as you do how Will is afflicted, you will help me to take that charge of him which I promised my mother on her deathbed that I would do, and which means that I shall keep him always with me and do all in my power to make his life happy. If you will do this, I will be your wife. If not, I remain unwed. But he may get dangerous. He can be but a trouble. His being here is a pain to you, Susan, not a pleasure. I ask you for either yes or no, said she, a little contempt at his evading her question, mingling with her tone. He perceived it, and it nettled him. And I have told you, I answered your question the last time I was here. I said I would ne'er keep house with an idiot. No more I will. So now you've gotten your answer. I have, said Susan, and she sighed deeply. Come now, said Mrs. Gale, encouraged by the sigh. One would think you don't love Michael, Susan to be so stubborn in yielding to what I am sure would be best for the lad. Oh, she does not care for me, said Michael. I don't believe she ever did. Don't I? Haven't I? asked Susan, her eyes blazing out fire. She left the room directly and sent Peggy in to make the tea, and catching at Will, who was lounging about in the kitchen, she went upstairs with him and bolted herself in straining the boy to her heart, and keeping almost breathless, lest any noise she made might cause him to break out into the howls and sounds which she could not bear that those below should hear. A knock at the door. It was Peggy. He wants for to see you, to wish you good-bye. I cannot come. Oh, Peggy, send them away. 
It was her only cry for sympathy, and the old servant understood it. She sent them away somehow, not politely, as I have been given to understand. Good go with them, said Peggy, as she grimly watched their retreating figures. We're rid of bad rubbish anyhow. And she turned into the house, with the intention of making ready some refreshment for Susan, after her hard day at the market and her harder evening. But in the kitchen, to which she passed through the empty house-place, making a face of contemptuous dislike at the used teacups and fragments of a meal yet standing there, she found Susan, with her sleeves tucked up and her working apron on, busied in preparing to make clap bread, one of the hardest and hottest domestic tasks of a daleswoman. She looked up, and first met, and then avoided Peggy's eye. It was too full of sympathy. Her own cheeks were flushed, and her own eyes were dry and burning. Where's the board, Peggy? We need clap bread, and, I reckon, I've time to get through with it tonight. Her voice had a sharp, dry tone in it, and her motions a jerking angularity about them. Peggy said nothing, but fetched all that she needed. Susan beat her cakes thin with vehement force. As she stooped over them, regardless even of the task in which she seemed so much occupied, she was surprised by a touch on her mouth of something, what she did not see at first. It was a cup of tea, delicately sweetened and cooled and held to her lips, when exactly ready by the faithful old woman. Susan held it off a hand's breadth and looked into Peggy's eyes while her own filled with the strange relief of tears. Lass, said Peggy solemnly, thou hast done well. It is not long to bide, and then the end will come. But you are very old, Peggy, said Susan, quivering. It is but a day, sin I were young, replied Peggy. But she stopped the conversation by again pushing the cup with gentle force to Susan's dry and thirsty lips. When she had drunken, she fell again to her labour, Peggy heating the hearth, and doing all that she knew would be required, but never speaking another word. Willie basked close to the fire, enjoying the animal luxury of warmth, for the autumn evenings were beginning to be chilly. It was one o'clock before they thought of going to bed on that memorable night. Half a Lifetime Ago, Part 4 The vehemence with which Susan Dixon threw herself into occupation could not last for ever. Times of languor and remembrance would come. Times when she recurred with a passionate yearning to bygone days, the recollection of which was so vivid and delicious that it seemed as though it were the reality and the present bleak barrenness the dream. She smiled anew at the magical sweetness of some touch or tone which in memory she felt and heard, and drank the delicious cup of poison, although at the very time she knew what the consequences of racking pain would be. This time last year, thought she, we went nutting together. This very day last year, just such a day as today. Purple and gold were the lights on the hills, the leaves were just turning brown. Here and there on the sunny slopes the stubble fields looked tawny. Down in a cleft of yon purple slate rock the beck fell like a silver glancing thread, all just as it is today. And he climbed the slender swaying nut trees and bent the branches for me to gather or made a passage through the hazel copses, from time to time claiming a toll. Who could have thought he loved me so little? Who? Who? Or as the evening closed in, she would allow herself to imagine that she heard his coming step, just that she might recall the feeling of exquisite delight which had passed by without the due and passionate relish at the time. Then she would wonder how she could have had the strength, the cruel self-piercing strength, to say what she had done, 
to stab herself with that stern resolution of which the scar would remain till her dying day it might have been right but as she sickened she wished she had not instinctively chosen the right how luxurious a life haunted by no stern sense of duty must be and many led this kind of life why could not she oh for one hour again of his sweet company if he came now she would agree to whatever he proposed it was a fever of the mind she passed through it and came out healthy if weak she was capable once more of taking pleasure in following an unseen guide through briar and brake she returned with tenfold affection to her protecting care of willie she acknowledged to herself that he was to be her all in all in life she made him her constant companion for his sake as the real owner of yew nook and she as his steward and guardian she began that course of careful saving and that love of acquisition which afterward gained for her the reputation of being miserly she still thought that he might regain a scanty portion of sense enough to require some simple pleasures and excitement which would cost money and money should not be wanting peggy rather assisted her in the formation of her parsimonious habits than otherwise economy was the order of the district and a certain degree of respectable avarice the characteristic of her age only willie was never stinted nor hindered of anything that the two women thought could give him pleasure for want of money there was one gratification which susan felt was needed for the restoration of her mind to its more healthy state after she had passed through the whirling fever when duty was as nothing and anarchy reigned a gratification that somehow was to be her last burst of unreasonableness of which she knew and recognized pain as the sure consequence she must see him once more herself unseen the week before the christmas of this memorable year she went out in the dusk of the early winter evening wrapped close in shawl and cloak she wore her dark shawl under her cloak putting it over her head in lieu of a bonnet for she knew that she might have to wait long in concealment then she tramped over the wet fell path shut in by misty rain for miles and miles till she came to the place where he was lodging a farmhouse in langdale with a steep stony lane leading up to it the lane was entered by a gate out of the main road and by the gate were a few bushes thorns but of them the leaves had fallen and they offered no concealment an old wreck of a yew tree grew among them however and underneath that susan cowered down shrouding her face of which the colour might betray her with a corner of her shawl long did she wait cold and cramped she became too damp and stiff to change her posture readily and after all he might never come but she would wait till daylight if need were and she pulled out a crust with which she had providently supplied herself the rain had ceased a dull still brooding weather had succeeded it was a night to hear distant sounds she heard horses hoofs striking and plashing in the stones and in the pools of the road at her back two horses not well ridden or even guided as she could tell michael hurst and a companion drew near not tipsy but not sober they stopped at the gate to bid each other a maudlin farewell michael stooped forward to catch the latch with the hook of the stick which she carried he dropped the stick and it fell with one end close to susan indeed with the slightest change of posture she could have opened the gate for him he swore a great oath and struck his horse with his closed fist as if that animal had been to blame then he dismounted opened the gate and fumbled about for his stick when he had found it susan had touched the other end his first use of it was to flog his horse well and she had much ado to avoid his kicks and plunges 
then still swearing he staggered up the lane for it was evident he was not sober enough to remount by daylight susan was back at her daily labours at yew nook when the spring came michael hurst was married to eleanor hebthwaite others too were married and christenings made their firesides merry and glad or they travelled and came back after long years with many wondrous tales more rarely perhaps a dalesman changed his dwelling but to all households more change came than to you nook there the seasons came round with monotonous sameness or if they brought mutation it was of a slow and decaying and depressing kind old peggy died her silent sympathy concealed under much roughness was a loss to susan dixon susan was not yet thirty when this happened but she looked a middle-aged not to say an elderly woman people affirmed that she had never recovered her complexion since that fever a dozen years ago which killed her father and left will dixon an idiot but besides her grey sallowness the lines in her face were strong and deep and hard the movements of her eyeballs were slow and heavy the wrinkles at the corners of her mouth and eyes were planted firm and sure not an ounce of unnecessary flesh was there on her bones every muscle started strongly and ready for use she needed all this bodily strength to a degree that no human creature now peggy was dead knew of for willie had grown up large and strong in body and in general docile enough in mind but every now and then he became first moody and then violent these paroxysms lasted but a day or two and it was susan's anxious care to keep their very existence hidden and unknown it is true that occasional passers-by on that lonely road heard sounds at night of knocking about of furniture blows and cries as of some tearing demon within the solitary farmhouse but these fits of violence usually occurred in the night and whatever had been their consequence susan had tidied and read it up all signs of aught unusual before the morning for above all she dreaded lest some one might find out in what danger and peril she occasionally was and might assume a right to take away her brother from her care the one idea of taking charge of him had deepened and deepened with the years it was graven into her mind as the object for which she lived the sacrifice she had made for this object only made it more precious to her besides she separated the idea of the docile affectionate loutish indolent will and kept it distinct from the terror which the demon that occasionally possessed him inspired her with the one was her flesh and her blood the child of her dead mother the other was some fiend who came to torture and convulse the creature she so loved she believed that she fought her brother's battle in holding down these tearing hands in binding whenever she could those uplifted restless arms prompt and prone to do mischief all the time she subdued him with her cunning or her strength she spoke to him in pitying murmurs or abused the third person the fiendish enemy in no unmeasured tones towards morning the paroxysm was exhausted and he would fall asleep perhaps only to waken with evil and renewed vigour but when he was laid down she would sally out to taste the fresh air and to work off her wild sorrow in cries and mutterings to herself the early labourers saw her gestures at a distance and thought her as crazed as the idiot brother who made the neighbourhood a haunted place but did any chance person call at you nook later on in the day he would find susan dixon cold calm collected her manner curt her wits keen once this fit of violence lasted longer than usual susan's strength both of mind and body was nearly worn out 
she wrestled in prayer that somehow it might end before she too was driven mad or worse might be obliged to give up life's aim and consign willie to a madhouse from that moment of prayer as she afterwards superstitiously thought willie calmed and then he drooped and then he sank and last of all he died in reality from physical exhaustion but he was so gentle and tender as he lay on his dying bed that such strange childlike gleams of returning intelligence came over his face long after the power to make his dull inarticulate sounds had departed that susan was attracted to him by a stronger tie than she had ever felt before it was something to have even an idiot loving her with dumb wistful animal affection something to have any creature looking at her with such beseeching eyes imploring protection from the insidious enemy stealing on and yet she knew that to him death was no enemy but a true friend restoring light and health to his poor clouded mind it was to her that death was an enemy to her the survivor when willie died there was no one to love her worse doom still there was no one left on earth for her to love you now know why no wandering tourist could persuade her to receive him as a lodger why no tired traveller could melt her heart to afford him rest and refreshment why long habits of seclusion had given her a moroseness of manner and how care for the interests of another had rendered her keen and miserly but there was a third act in the drama of her life half a lifetime ago part five in spite of peggy's prophecy that susan's life should not seem long it did seem wearisome and endless as the years slowly uncoiled their monotonous circles to be sure she might have made changes for herself but she did not care to do it it was indeed more than not caring which merely implies a certain degree of vis inertiae to be subdued before an object can be attained and that the object itself does not seem to be of sufficient importance to call out the requisite energy on the contrary susan exerted herself to avoid change and variety she had a morbid dread of new faces which originated in her desire to keep poor dead willie's state a profound secret she had a contempt for new customs and indeed her old ways prospered so well under her active hand and vigilant eye that it was difficult to know how they could be improved upon she was regularly present in coniston market with the best butter and the earliest chickens of the season those were the common farm produce that every farmer's wife about had to sell but susan after she had disposed of the more feminine articles turned to on the man's side a better judge of a horse or cow there was not in all the country round yorkshire itself might have attempted to jockey her and would have failed her corn was sound and clean her potatoes well preserved to the latest spring people began to talk of the hoards of money susan dixon must have laid up somewhere and one young ne'er-do-well of a farmer's son undertook to make love to the woman of forty who looked fifty-five if a day he made up to her by opening a gate on the road path home as she was riding on a bare-backed horse her purchase not an hour ago she was off before him refusing his civility but the remounting was not so easy and rather than fail she did not choose to attempt it she walked and he walked alongside improving his opportunity which as he vainly thought had been consciously granted to him as they drew near you nook he ventured on some expression of a wish to keep company with her his words were vague and clumsily arranged susan turned round and coolly asked him to explain himself he took courage as he thought of her reputed wealth and expressed his wishes this second time pretty plainly 
to his surprise the reply she made was in a series of smart strokes across his shoulders administered through the medium of a supple hazel switch take that said she almost breathless to teach thee how thou darest make a fool of an honest woman old enough to be thy mother if thou comest a step nearer the house there's a good horse pool and there's two stout fellows who'll like no better fun than ducking thee be off with thee and she strode into her own premises never looking round to see whether he obeyed her injunction or not sometimes three or four years would pass over without her hearing michael hurst's name mentioned she used to wonder at such times whether he were dead or alive she would sit for hours by the dying embers of her fire on a winter's evening trying to recall the scenes of her youth trying to bring up living pictures of the faces she had then known michael's most especially she thought it was possible so long had been the lapse of years that she might now pass by him in the street unknowing and unknown his outward form she might not recognize but himself she would feel in the thrill of her whole being he could not pass her unawares what little she did hear about him all testified a downward tendency he drank not at stated times when there was no other work to be done but continually whether it was seed time or harvest his children were all ill at the same time then one died while the others recovered but were poor sickly things no one dared to give susan any direct intelligence of her former lover many avoided all mention of his name in her presence but a few spoke out either in indifference to or in ignorance of those bygone days susan heard every word every whisper every sound that related to him but her eye never changed nor did a muscle of her face move late one november night she sat over her fire not a human being besides herself in the house none but she had ever slept there since willie's death the farm labourers had foddered the cattle and gone home hours before there were crickets chirping all round the warm hearth stones there was the clock ticking with the peculiar beat susan had known from her childhood and which then and ever since she had oddly associated with the idea of a mother and child talking together one loud tick and quick a feeble sharp one following the day had been keen and piercingly cold the whole lift of heaven seemed a dome of iron black and frost-bound was the earth under the cruel east wind now the wind had dropped and as the darkness had gathered in the weather-wise old labourers prophesied snow the sounds in the air rose again as susan sat still and silent they were of a different character to what they had been during the prevalence of the east wind then they had been shrill and piping now they were like low distant growling not unmusical but strangely threatening susan went to the window and drew aside the little curtain the whole world was white the air was blinded with the swift and heavy fall of snow at present it came down straight but susan knew those distant sounds in the hollows and gullies of the hills portended a driving wind and a more cruel storm she thought of her sheep were they all folded the new-born calf was it bedded well before the drifts were formed too deep for her to pass in and out and by the morning she judged that they would be six or seven feet deep she would go out and see after the comfort of her beasts she took a lantern and tied a shawl over her head and went out into the open air she had tenderly provided for all her animals and was returning when borne on the blast as if some spirit cry for it seemed to come rather down from the skies than from any creature standing on earth's level she heard a voice of agony she could not distinguish words it seemed rather as if some bird of prey was being caught in the swirl of the icy wind and torn and tortured by its violence again up high above 
susan put down her lantern and shouted loud in return it was an instinct for if the creature were not human which she had doubted but a moment before what good could her responding cry do and her cry was seized on by the tyrannous wind and borne farther away in the opposite direction to that from which the call of agony had proceeded again she listened no sound then again it rang through space and this time she was sure it was human she turned into the house and heaped turf and wood on the fire which careless of her own sensations she had allowed to fade and almost die out she put a new candle in her lantern she changed her shawl for a maud and leaving the door on latch she sallied out just at the moment when her ear first encountered the weird noises of the storm on issuing forth into the open air she thought she heard the words o oh god o oh help they were a guide to her if words they were for they came straight from a rock not a quarter of a mile from yew nook but only to be reached on account of its precipitous character by a roundabout path thither she steered defying wind and snow guided by here a thorn-tree there an old dotted oak which had not quite lost their identity under the whelming mask of snow now and then she stopped to listen but never a word or sound heard she till right from where the copsewood grew thick and tangled at the base of the rock round which she was winding she heard a moan into the break all snow in appearance almost a plain of snow looked on from the little eminence where she stood she plunged breaking down the bush stumbling bruising herself fighting her way her lantern held between her teeth and she herself using head as well as hands to butt away a passage at whatever cost of bodily injury as she climbed or staggered owing to the unevenness of the snow-covered ground where the briars and weeds of years were tangled and matted together her foot felt something strangely soft and yielding she lowered her lantern there lay a man prone on his face nearly covered by the fast-falling flakes he must have fallen from the rock above as not knowing of the circuitous path he had tried to descend its steep slippery face who could tell it was no time for thinking susan lifted him up with her wiry strength he gave no help no sign of life but for all that he might be alive he was still warm she tied her maud round him she fastened the lantern to her apron string she held him tight half carrying half dragging what did a few bruises signify to him compared to dear life to precious life she got him through the break and down the path there for an instant she stopped to take breath but as if stung by the furies she pushed on again with almost superhuman strength clasping him round the waist and leaning his dead weight against the lintel of the door she tried to undo the latch but now just at this moment a trembling faintness came over her and a fearful dread took possession of her that here on the very threshold of her home she might be found dead and buried under the snow when the farm servants came in the morning this terror stirred her up to one more effort then she and her companion were in the warmth of the quiet haven of that kitchen she laid him on the settle and sank to the floor by his side how long she remained in this swoon she could not tell not very long she judged by the fire which was still red and sullenly glowing when she came to herself she lighted the candle and bent over her late burden to ascertain if indeed he were dead she stood long gazing the man lay dead there could be no doubt about it his filmy eyes glared at her unshut but susan was not one to be affrighted by the stony aspect of death it was not that it was the bitter woeful recognition of michael hurst she was convinced he was dead but after a while she refused to believe in her conviction she stripped off his wet outer garments with trembling hurried hands she brought a blanket down from her own bed she made up the fire 
she swathed him in fresh warm wrappings and laid him on the flags before the fire sitting herself at his head and holding it in her lap while she tenderly wiped his loose wet hair curly still although its colour had changed from nut brown to iron grey since she had seen it last from time to time she bent over the face afresh sick and fain to believe that the flicker of the firelight was some slight convulsive motion but the dim staring eyes struck chill to her heart at last she ceased her delicate busy cares but she still held the head softly as if caressing it she thought over all the possibilities and chances in the mingled yarn of their lives that might by so slight a turn have ended far otherwise if her mother's cold had been early tendered so that the responsibility as to her brother's weal or woe had not fallen upon her if the fever had not taken such rough cruel hold on will nay if mrs gale that hard worldly sister had not accompanied him on his last visit to you nook his very last before this fatal stormy night if she had heard his cry cry uttered by those pale dead lips with such wild despairing agony not yet three hours ago oh if she had but heard it sooner he might have been saved before that blind false step had precipitated him down the rock in going over this weary chain of unrealized possibilities susan learnt the force of peggy's words life was short looking back upon it it seemed but yesterday since all the love of her being had been poured out and run to waste the intervening years the long monotonous years that had turned her into an old woman before her time were but a dream the labourers coming in the dawn of the winter's day were surprised to see the firelight through the low kitchen window they knocked and hearing a moaning answer they entered fearing that something had befallen their mistress for all explanation they got these words it is michael hurst he was belated and fell down the raven's crag where does eleanor his wife live how michael hurst got to you nook no one but susan ever knew they thought he had dragged himself there with some sore internal bruise sapping away his minuted life they could not have believed the superhuman exertion which had first sought him out and then dragged him hither only susan knew of that she gave him into the charge of her servants and went out and saddled her horse where the wind had drifted the snow on one side and the road was clear and bare she rode and rode fast where the soft deceitful heaps were massed up she dismounted and led her steed plunging in deep with fierce energy the pain at her heart urging her onward with a sharp digging spur the grey solemn winter's noon was more night-like than the depth of summer's night dim purple brooded the low skies over the white earth as susan rode up to what had been michael hurst's abode while living it was a small farmhouse carelessly kept outside slatternly tended within the pretty nelly hebthwaite was pretty still her delicate face had never suffered from any long enduring feeling if anything its expression was that of plaintive sorrow but the soft light hair had scarcely a tinge of grey the wood rose tint of complexion yet remained if not so brilliant as in youth the straight nose the small mouth were untouched by time susan felt the contrast even at that moment she knew that her own skin was weather-beaten furrowed brown that her teeth were gone and her hair grey and ragged and yet she was not two years older than nelly she had not been in youth when she took account of these things nelly stood wondering at the strange enough horsewoman who stopped and panted at the door holding her horse's bridle and refusing to enter where is michael hurst asked susan at last well i can't rightly say he should have been at home last night but he was off seeing after a public-house to be let at ulverston for our farm does not answer 
and we were thinking he did not come home last night said susan cutting short the story and half affirming half questioning by way of letting in a ray of the awful light before she let it full in in its consuming wrath no he'll be stopping somewhere out ulverston ways i'm sure we've need of him at home for i've no one but little tommy to help me tend the beasts things have not gone well with us and we don't keep a servant now but you're trembling all over ma'am you'd better come in and take something warm while your horse rests that's the stable door to your left susan took her horse there loosened his girths and rubbed him down with a wisp of straw then she looked about her for hay but the place was bare of food and smelt damp and unused she went to the house thankful for the respite and got some clap bread which she mashed up in a pailful of lukewarm water every moment was a respite and yet every moment made her dread the more the task that lay before her it would be longer than she thought at first she took the saddle off and hung about her horse which seemed somehow more like a friend than anything else in the world she laid her cheek against its neck and rested there before returning to the house for the last time eleanor had brought down one of her own gowns which hung on a chair against the fire and had made her unknown visitor a cup of hot tea susan could hardly bear all these little attentions they choked her and yet she was so wet so weak with fatigue and excitement that she could neither resist by voice or by action two children stood awkwardly about puzzled at the scene and even eleanor began to wish for some explanation of who her strange visitor was you've maybe heard him speak of me i'm called susan dixon nelly coloured and avoided meeting susan's eye i've heard other folk speak of you he never named your name this respect of silence came like balm to susan balm not felt or heeded at the time it was applied but very grateful in its effects for all that he is at my house continued susan determined not to stop or quaver in the operation the pain which must be inflicted at your house you nook questioned eleanor surprised how came he there half jealously did he take shelter from the coming storm tell me there is something tell me woman he took no shelter would to god he had oh would to god would to god shrieked out eleanor learning all from the woeful import of those dreary eyes her cries thrilled through the house the children's piping wailings and passionate cries on daddy daddy pierced into susan's very marrow but she remained as still and tearless as the great round face upon the clock at last in a lull of crying she said not exactly questioning but as if partly to herself you loved him then loved him he was my husband he was the father of three bonny bairns that lie dead in grassmere churchyard i wish you'd go susan dixon and let me weep without your watching me i wish you'd never come near the place alas alas it would not have brought him to life i would have laid down my own to save his my life has been so very sad no one would have cared if i had died alas alas the tone in which she said this was so utterly mournful and despairing that it awed nelly into quiet for a time but by and by she said i would not turn a dog out to do it harm but the night is clear and tommy shall guide you to the red cow but oh i want to be alone if you'll come back to-morrow i'll be better and i'll hear all and thank you for every kindness you have shown him and i do believe you've shown him kindness though i don't know why susan moved heavily and strangely she said something her words came 
thick and unintelligible she had had a paralytic stroke since she had last spoken she could not go even if she would nor did eleanor when she became aware of the state of the case wish her to leave she had her laid on her own bed and weeping silently all the while for her lost husband she nursed susan like a sister she did not know what her guest's worldly position might be and she might never be repaid but she sold many a little trifle to purchase such small comforts as susan needed susan lying still and motionless learnt much it was not a severe stroke it might be the forerunner of others yet to come but at some distance of time but for the present she recovered and regained much of her former health on her sick bed she matured her plans when she returned to eunuch she took michael hurst's widow and children with her to live there and fill up the haunted hearth with living forms that should banish the ghosts and so it fell out that the latter days of susan dixon's life were better than the former when this narrative was finished mrs dawson called on our two gentlemen signor sperano and mr preston and told them that they had hitherto been amused or interested but that it was now their turn to amuse or interest they looked at each other as if this application of hers took them by surprise and seemed altogether as much abashed as well-grown men can ever be signor sperano was the first to recover himself after thinking a little he said your will dear lady is law next monday evening i will bring you an old old story which i found among the papers of the good old priest who first welcomed me to england it was but a poor return for his generous kindness but i had the opportunity of nursing him through the cholera of which he died he left me all that he had no money but his scanty furniture his book of prayers his crucifix and rosary and his papers how some of those papers came into his hands i know not they had evidently been written many years before the venerable man was born and i doubt whether he had ever examined the bundles which had come down to him from some old ancestor or in some strange bequest his life was too busy to leave any time for the gratification of mere curiosity i alas have only had too much leisure next monday signor sperano read to us the story which i will call the poor clare end of half a lifetime ago the poor clare part one december the twelfth seventeen forty seven my life has been strangely bound up with extraordinary incidents some of which occurred before i had any connection with the principal actors in them or indeed before i even knew of their existence i suppose most old men are like me more given to looking back upon their own careers with a kind of fond interest and affectionate remembrance than to watching the events though these may have far more interest for the multitude immediately passing before their eyes if this should be the case with the generality of old people how much more so with me if i am to enter upon that strange story connected with poor lucy i must begin a long way back i myself only came to the knowledge of her family history after i knew her but to make the tale clear to any one else i must arrange events in the order in which they occurred not that in which i became acquainted with them there is a great old hall in the north-east of lancashire in a part they called the trough of bolland adjoining that other district named craven starkey manor house is rather like a number of rooms clustered around a grey massive old keep than a regularly built hall 
indeed i suppose that the house only consisted of the great tower in the centre in the days when the scots made their raids terrible as far south as this and that after the stuarts came in and there was a little more security of property in those parts the starkies of that time added the lower building which runs two stories high all round the base of the keep there has been a grand garden laid out in my days on the southern slope near the house but when i first knew the place the kitchen garden at the farm was the only piece of cultivated ground belonging to it the deer used to come within sight of the drawing-room windows and might have browsed quite close up to the house if they had not been too wild and shy starkey manor house itself stood on a projection or peninsula of high land jutting out from the abrupt hills that formed the sides of the trough of bolland these hills were rocky and bleak enough towards their summit lower down they were clothed with tangled copsewood and green depths of fern out of which a grey giant of an ancient forest tree would tower here and there throwing up its ghastly white branches as if in imprecation to the sky these trees they told me were the remnants of that forest which existed in the days of the heptarchy and were even then noted as landmarks no wonder that their upper and more exposed branches were leafless and that the dead bark had peeled away from sapless old age not far from the house there were a few cottages apparently of the same date as the keep probably built for some retainers of the family who sought shelter they and their families and their small flocks and herds at the hands of their feudal landlord some of them had pretty much fallen to decay they were built in a strange fashion strong beams had been sunk firm in the ground at the requisite distance and their other ends had been fastened together two and two so as to form the shape of one of those rounded wagon-headed gypsy tents only very much larger the spaces between were filled with mud stones osiers rubbish mortar anything to keep out the weather the fires were made in the centre of these rude dwellings a hole in the roof forming the only chimney no highland hut or irish cabin could be of rougher construction the owner of this property at the beginning of the present century was a mr patrick burn starkey his family had kept to the old faith and were staunch roman catholics esteeming it even a sin to marry any one of protestant descent however willing he or she might have been to embrace the romish religion mr patrick starkey's father had been a follower of james the second and during the disastrous irish campaign of that monarch had fallen in love with an irish beauty a miss byrne as zealous for her religion and for the stuarts as himself he had returned to ireland after his escape to france and married her bearing her back to the court at saint germain but some license on the part of the disorderly gentlemen who surrounded king james in his exile had insulted his beautiful wife and disgusted him so he removed from saint germain to antwerp whence in a few years time he quietly returned to starkey manor house some of his lancashire neighbours having lent their good offices to reconcile him to the powers that were he was as firm a roman catholic as ever and as staunch an advocate for the stuarts and the divine right of kings but his religion almost amounted to asceticism and the conduct of those with whom he had been brought in such close contact at saint germain would little bear the inspection of a stern moralist so he gave his allegiance where he could not give his esteem and learned to respect sincerely the upright and moral character of one whom he yet regarded as an usurper king william's government had little need to fear such a one so he returned as i have said with a sobered heart and impoverished fortunes to his ancestral house which had fallen sadly to ruin while the owner had been a courtier a soldier and an exile the roads into the trough of bolland were little more than cart ruts indeed the way up to the house lay along a ploughed field before you came to the deer park 
Madame, as the country folk used to call Mrs. Starkey, rode on a pillion behind her husband, holding on to him with a light hand by his leather riding belt. Little Master, he that was afterwards Squire Patrick Byrne Starkey, was held on to his pony by a serving man. A woman past middle age walked, with a firm and strong step, by the cart that held much of the baggage and high up on the mails and boxes sat a girl of dazzling beauty perched lightly on the topmost trunk and swaying herself fearlessly to and fro as the cart rocked and shook in the heavy roads of late autumn the girl wore the antwerp file or black spanish mantle over her head and altogether her appearance was such that the old cottager who described the procession to me many years after said that all the country folk took her for a foreigner some dogs and the boy who held them in charge made up the company they rode silently along looking with grave serious eyes at the people who came out of the scattered cottages to bow or curtsy to the real squire come back at last and gazed after the little procession with gaping wonder not deadened by the sound of the foreign language in which the few necessary words that passed among them were spoken one lad called from his staring by the squire to come and help about the cart accompanied them to the manor house he said that when the lady had descended from her pillion the middle-aged woman whom i have described as walking while the others rode stepped quickly forward and taking madame starkey who was of a slight and delicate figure in her arms she lifted her over the threshold and set her down in her husband's house at the same time uttering a passionate and outlandish blessing the squire stood by smiling gravely at first but when the words of blessing were pronounced he took off his fine feathered hat and bent his head the girl with the black mantle stepped onward into the shadow of the dark hall and kissed the lady's hand and that was all the lad could tell to the group that gathered round him on his return eager to hear everything and to know how much the squire had given him for his services from all i could gather the manor house at the time of the squire's return was in the most dilapidated state the stout grey walls remained firm and entire but the inner chambers had been used for all kinds of purposes the great withdrawing-room had been a barn the state tapestry chamber had held wool and so on but by and by they were cleared out and if the squire had no money to spend on new furniture he and his wife had the knack of making the best of the old he was no despicable joiner she had a kind of grace in whatever she did and imparted an air of elegant picturesqueness on whatever she touched besides they had brought many rare things from the continent perhaps i should say rather things that were rare in that part of england carvings and crosses and beautiful pictures and then again wood was plentiful in the trough of Holland and great log fires danced and glittered in all the dark old rooms and gave a look of home and comfort to everything why do i tell you all this i have little to do with the squire and madame starkey and yet i dwell upon them as if i were unwilling to come to the real people with whom my life was so strangely mixed up madame had been nursed in ireland by the very woman who lifted her in her arms and welcomed her to her husband's home in lancashire excepting for the short period of her own married life bridget fitzgerald had never left her nursling her marriage to one above her in rank had been unhappy her husband had died and left her in even greater poverty than that in which she was when he had first met with her she had one child the beautiful daughter who came riding on the wagon load of furniture that was brought to the manor house madame starkey had taken her again into her service when she became a widow she and her daughter had followed the mistress in all her fortunes they had lived at st germain and at antwerp and were now come to her home in lancashire as soon as bridget had arrived there 
the squire gave her a cottage of her own and took more pains in furnishing it for her than he did in anything else out of his own house it was only nominally her residence she was constantly up at the great house indeed it was but a short cut across the woods from her own home to the home of her nursling her daughter mary in like manner moved from one house to the other at her own will madame loved both mother and child dearly they had great influence over her and through her over her husband whatever bridget or mary willed was sure to come to pass they were not disliked for though wild and passionate they were also generous by nature but the other servants were afraid of them as being in secret the ruling spirits of the household the squire had lost his interest in all secular things madame was gentle affectionate and yielding both husband and wife were tenderly attached to each other and to their boy but they grew more and more to shun the trouble of decision on any point and hence it was that bridget could exert such despotic power but if every one else yielded to her magic of a superior mind her daughter not unfrequently rebelled she and her mother were too much alike to agree there were wild quarrels between them and wilder reconciliations there were times when in the heat of passion they could have stabbed each other at all other times they both bridget especially would have willingly laid down their lives for one another bridget's love for her child lay very deep deeper than the daughter ever knew or i should think she would never have wearied of home as she did and prayed her mistress to obtain for her some situation as waiting-maid beyond the seas in that more cheerful continental life among the scenes of which so many of her happiest years had been spent she thought as youth thinks that life would last for ever and that two or three years were but a small portion of it to pass away from her mother whose only child she was bridget thought differently but was too proud ever to show what she felt if her child wished to leave her why she should go but people said that bridget became ten years older in the course of two months at this time she took it that mary wanted to leave her the truth was that mary wanted for a time to leave the place and to seek some change and would thankfully have taken her mother with her indeed when madame starkey had gotten her a situation with some grand lady abroad and the time drew near for her to go it was mary who clung to her mother with passionate embrace and with floods of tears declared that she would never leave her and it was bridget who at last loosened her arms and grave and tearless herself bade her keep her word and go forth into the wide world sobbing aloud and looking back continually mary went away bridget was still as death scarcely drawing her breath or closing her stony eyes till at last she turned back into her cottage and heaved a ponderous old settle against the door there she sat motionless over the grey ashes of her extinguished fire deaf to madame's sweet voice as she begged leave to enter and comfort her nurse deaf stony and motionless she sat for more than twenty hours till for the third time madame came across the snowy path from the great house carrying with her a young spaniel which had been mary's pet up at the hall and which had not ceased all night long to seek for its absent mistress and to whine and moan after her with tears madame told this story through the closed door tears excited by the terrible look of anguish so steady so immovable so the same to-day as it was yesterday on her nurse's face the little creature in her arms began to utter its piteous cry as it shivered with the cold bridget stirred she moved she listened again that long whine she thought it was for her daughter and what she had denied to her nursling and mistress she granted to the dumb creature that mary had cherished she opened the door and took the dog from madame's arms then madame came in 
and kissed and comforted the old woman who took but little notice of her or anything and sending up master patrick to the hall for fire and food the sweet young lady never left her nurse all that night next day the squire himself came down carrying a beautiful foreign picture our lady of the holy heart the papists call it it is a picture of the virgin her heart pierced with arrows each arrow representing one of her great woes that picture hung in bridget's cottage when i first saw her i have that picture now years went on mary was still abroad bridget was still and stern instead of active and passionate the little dog mignon was indeed her darling i have heard that she talked to it continually although to most people she was so silent the squire and madame treated her with the greatest consideration and well they might for to them she was as devoted and faithful as ever mary wrote pretty often and seemed satisfied with her life but at length the letters ceased i hardly know whether before or after a great and terrible sorrow came upon the house of the starkeys the squire sickened of a putrid fever and madame caught it in nursing him and died you may be sure bridget let no other woman tend her but herself and in the very arms that had received her at her birth that sweet young woman laid her head down and gave up her breath the squire recovered in a fashion he was never strong he had never the heart to smile again he fasted and prayed more than ever and people did say that he tried to cut off the entail and leave all the property away to found a monastery abroad of which he prayed that some day little squire patrick might be the reverend father but he could not do this for the strictness of the entail and the laws against the papists so he could only appoint gentlemen of his own faith as guardians to his son with many charges about the lad's soul and a few about the land and the way it was to be held while he was a minor of course bridget was not forgotten he sent for her as he lay on his deathbed and asked her if she would rather have a sum down or have the small annuity settled upon her she said at once she would have a sum down for she thought of her daughter and how she could bequeath the money to her whereas an annuity would have died with her so the squire left her her cottage for life and a fair sum of money and then he died with as ready and willing a heart as i suppose ever any gentleman took out of this world with him the young squire was carried off by his guardians and bridget was left alone i have said that she had not heard from mary for some time in her last letter she had told of travelling about with her mistress who was the english wife of some great foreign officer and had spoken of her chances of making a good marriage without naming the gentleman's name keeping it rather back as a pleasant surprise to her mother his station and fortune being as i have afterwards reason to know far superior to anything she had a right to expect then came a long silence and madame was dead and the squire was dead and bridget's heart was gnawed by anxiety and she knew not whom to ask for news of her child she could not write and the squire had managed her communication with her daughter she walked off to hurst and got a good priest there one whom she had known at antwerp to write for her but no answer came it was like crying into the awful stillness of night one day bridget was missed by those neighbours who had been accustomed to mark her goings out and comings in she had never been sociable with any of them but the sight of her had become a part of their daily lives and slow wonder arose in their minds as morning after morning came and her house door remained closed her window dead from any glitter or light of fire within at length some one tried the door it was locked two or three laid their heads together before daring to look in through the blank unshuttered window 
but at last they summoned up courage and then saw that bridget's absence from their little world was not the result of accident or death but of premeditation such small articles of furniture as could be secured from the effects of time and damp by being packed up were stowed away in boxes the picture of the madonna was taken down and gone in a word bridget had stolen away from her home and left no trace whither she was departed i knew afterwards that she and her little dog had wandered off on the long search for her lost daughter she was too illiterate to have faith in letters even had she had the means of writing and sending many but she had faith in her own strong love and believed that her passionate instinct would guide her to her child besides foreign travel was no new thing to her and she could speak enough of french to explain the object of her journey and had moreover the advantage of being from her faith a welcome object of charitable hospitality at many a distant convent but the country people round starkey manor house knew nothing of all this they wondered what had become of her in a torpid lazy fashion and then left off thinking of her altogether several years passed both manor house and cottage were deserted the young squire lived far away under the direction of his guardians there were inroads of wool and corn into the sitting-rooms of the hall and there was some low talk from time to time among the hinds and country people whether it would not be as well to break into old bridget's cottage and save such of her goods as were left from the moth and rust which must be making sad havoc but this idea was always quenched by the recollection of her strong character and passionate anger and tales of her masterful spirit and vehement force of will were whispered about till the very thought of offending her by touching any article of hers became invested with a kind of horror it was believed that dead or alive she would not fail to avenge it suddenly she came home with as little noise or note of preparation as she had departed one day some one noticed a thin blue curl of smoke ascending from her chimney her door stood open to the noonday sun and ere many hours had elapsed some one had seen an old travelled and sorrow-stained woman dipping her picture in the well and said that the dark solemn eyes that looked up at him were more like bridget fitzgerald's than any one else's in this world and yet if it were she she looked as if she had been scorched in the flames of hell so brown and scared and fierce a creature did she seem by and by many saw her and those who met her eye once cared not to be caught looking at her again she had got into the habit of perpetually talking to herself nay more answering herself and varying her tones according to the side she took at the moment it was no wonder that those who dared to listen outside her door at night believed she held converse with some spirit in short she was unconsciously earning for herself the dreadful reputation of a witch her little dog which had wandered half over the continent with her was her only companion a dumb remembrancer of happier days once he was ill and she carried him more than three miles to ask about his management from one who had been groom to the last squire and had then been noted for his skill in all diseases of animals whatever this man did the dog recovered and they who heard her thanks intermingled with blessings that were rather promises of good fortune than prayers looked grave at his good luck when next year his ewes twinned and his meadow grass was heavy and thick now it so happened that about the year seventeen hundred and eleven one of the guardians of the young squire a certain sir philip tempest bethought him of the good shooting there must be on his ward's property and in consequence he brought down four or five gentlemen of his friends to stay for a week or two at the hall from all accounts they roistered and spent pretty freely i never heard any of their names but one and that was squire gisborne's he was hardly a middle-aged man then he had been much abroad 
and there i believe he had known sir philip tempest and done him some service he was a daring and dissolute fellow in those days careless and fearless and one who would rather be in a quarrel than out of it he had his fits of ill temper besides when he would spare neither man nor beast otherwise those who knew him well used to say he had a good heart when he was neither drunk nor angry nor in any way vexed he had altered much when i came to know him one day the gentlemen had all been out shooting and with but little success i believe anyhow mr gisborne had had none and was in a black humour accordingly he was coming home having his gun loaded sportsmanlike when little mignon crossed his path just as he turned out of the wood by bridget's cottage partly for wantonness partly to vent his spleen upon some living creature mr gisborne took his gun and fired he had better have never fired gun again than aimed that unlucky shot he hit mignon and at the creature's sudden cry bridget came out and saw at a glance what had been done she took mignon up in her arms and looked hard at the wound the poor dog looked at her with his glazing eyes and tried to wag his tail and lick her hand all covered with blood mr gisborne spoke in a kind of sullen penitence you should have kept the dog out of my way a little poaching varmint at this very moment mignon stretched out his legs and stiffened in her arms her lost mary's dog who had wondered and sorrowed with her for years she walked right into mr gisborne's path and fixed his unwilling sullen look with her dark and terrible eye those never throve that did me harm said she i'm alone in the world and helpless the more do the saints in heaven hear my prayers hear me ye blessed ones hear me while i ask for sorrow on this bad cruel man he has killed the only creature that loved me the dumb beast that i loved bring down heavy sorrow on his head for it o ye saints he thought that i was helpless because he saw me lonely and poor but are not the armies of heaven for the like of me come come said he half remorseful but not one whit afraid here's a crown to buy thee another dog take it and leave off cursing i care none for thy threats don't you said she coming a step closer and changing her imprecatory cry for a whisper which made the gamekeeper's lad following mr gisborne creep all over you shall live to see the creature you love best and who alone loves you ay a human creature but as innocent and fond as my poor dead darling you shall see this creature for whom death would be too happy become a terror and a loathing to all for this blood's sake hear me o holy saints who never fail them that have no other help she threw up her right hand filled with poor mignon's life drops they spurted one or two of them on his shooting dress an ominous sight to the follower but the master only laughed a little forced scornful laugh and went on to the hall before he got there however he took out a gold piece and bade the boy carry it to the old woman on his return to the village the lad was afeard as he told me in after years he came to the cottage and hovered about not daring to enter he peeped through the window at last and by the flickering wood flame he saw bridget kneeling before the picture of our lady of the holy heart with dead mignon lying between her and the madonna she was praying wildly as her outstretched arms betokened the lad shrank away in redoubled terror and contented himself with slipping the gold piece under the ill-fitting door the next day it was thrown out upon the midden and there it lay no one daring to touch it meanwhile mr gisborne half curious half uneasy thought to lessen his uncomfortable feelings by asking sir philip who bridget was he could only describe her he did not know her name sir philip was equally at a loss but an old servant of the starkeys who had resumed his livery at the hall on this occasion 
a scoundrel whom bridget had saved from dismissal more than once during her palmy days said it will be the old witch that his worship means she needs a ducking if ever woman did does that bridget fitzgerald fitzgerald said both the gentlemen at once but sir philip was the first to continue i must have no talk of ducking her dickon why she must be the very woman poor starkey bade me have a care of but when i came here last she was gone no one knew where i'll go and see her to-morrow but mind you sirrah if any harm comes to her or any more talk of her being a witch i've a pack of hounds at home who can follow the scent of a lying knave as well as ever they follow a dog fox so take care how you talk about ducking a faithful old servant of your dead master's had she ever a daughter asked mr gisborne after a while i don't know yes i've a notion she had a kind of waiting woman to madame starkey please your worship said humble dickon mistress bridget had a daughter one mistress mary who went abroad and has never been heard of since and folk do say that she has crazed her mother mr gisborne shaded his eyes with his hand i could wish she had not cursed me he muttered she may have power no one else could after a while he said aloud no one understanding rightly what he meant tush it's impossible and called for claret and he and the other gentlemen set to to a drinking bout the poor clare part two i now come to the time in which i myself was mixed up with the people that i have been writing about and to make you understand how i became connected with them i must give you some little account of myself my father was the younger son of a devonshire gentleman of moderate property my eldest uncle succeeded to the estate of his forefathers my second became an eminent attorney in london and my father took orders like most poor clergymen he had a large family and i have no doubt was glad enough when my london uncle who was a bachelor offered to take charge of me and bring me up to be his successor in business in this way i came to live in london in my uncle's house not far from gray's inn and to be treated and esteemed as his son and to labour with him in his office i was very fond of the old gentleman he was the confidential agent of many country squires and had attained to his present position as much by knowledge of human nature as by knowledge of law though he was learned enough in the latter he used to say his business was law his pleasure heraldry from his intimate acquaintance with family history and all the tragic courses of life therein involved to hear him talk at leisure times about any coat of arms that came across his path was as good as a play or a romance many cases of disputed property dependent on a love of genealogy were brought to him as to a great authority on such points if the lawyer who came to consult him was young he would take no fee only give him a long lecture on the importance of attending to heraldry if the lawyer was of mature age and good standing he would mock him pretty well and abuse him to me afterwards as negligent of one great branch of the profession his house was in a stately new street called ormond street and in it he had a handsome library but all the books treated of things that were past none of them planned or looked forward into the future i worked away partly for the sake of my family at home partly because my uncle had really taught me to enjoy the kind of practice in which he himself took such delight i suspect i worked too hard at any rate in seventeen hundred and eighteen i was far from well and my good uncle was disturbed by my ill looks one day he rang the bell twice into the clerk's room at the dingy office in gray's inn lane it was the summons for me and i went in to his private room just as a gentleman whom i knew well enough by sight 
as an irish lawyer of more reputation than he deserved was leaving my uncle was slowly rubbing his hands together and considering i was there two or three minutes before he spoke then he told me that i must pack up my portmanteau that very afternoon and start that night by post horse for westchester i should get there if all went well at the end of five days time and must then wait for a packet to cross over to dublin from thence i must proceed to a certain town named Kildoon, and in that neighbourhood I was to remain, making certain inquiries as to the existence of any descendants of the younger branch of a family to whom some valuable estates had descended in the female line. The Irish lawyer whom I had seen was weary of the case, and would willingly have given up the property without further ado to a man who appeared to claim them but on laying his tables and trees before my uncle the latter had foreseen so many possible prior claimants that the lawyer had begged him to undertake the management of the whole business in his youth my uncle would have liked nothing better than going over to ireland himself and ferreting out every scrap of paper or parchment and every word of tradition respecting the family as it was old and gouty he deputed me Accordingly, I went to Kildoon. I suspect I had something of my uncle's delight in following up a genealogical scent, for I very soon found out, when on the spot, that Mr. Rooney, the Irish lawyer, would have got both himself and the first claimant into a terrible scrape if he had pronounced his opinion that the estates ought to be given up to him. There were three poor Irish fellows, each nearer of kin, to the last possessor but a generation before there was a still nearer relation who had never been accounted for nor his existence ever discovered by the lawyers i venture to think till i routed him out from the memory of some of the old dependents of the family what had become of him i travelled backwards and forwards i crossed over to france and came back again with a slight clue which ended in my discovering that wild and dissipated himself he had left one child a son of yet worse character than his father that this same hugh fitzgerald had married a very beautiful serving woman of the burns a person below him in hereditary rank but above him in character that he had died soon after his marriage leaving one child whether a boy or girl i could not learn and that the mother had returned to live in the family of the burns now the chief of this latter family was serving in the duke of berwick's regiment and it was long before i could hear from him it was more than a year before i got a short haughty letter i fancy he had a soldier's contempt for a civilian an irishman's hatred for an englishman an exiled jacobite's jealousy of one who prospered and lived tranquilly under the government he looked upon as an usurpation bridget fitzgerald he said had been faithful to the fortunes of his sister had followed her abroad and to england when mrs starkey had thought fit to return both her sister and her husband were dead he knew nothing of bridget fitzgerald at the present time probably sir philip tempest his nephew's guardian might be able to give me some information i have not given the little contemptuous terms the way in which faithful service was meant to imply more than it said all that has nothing to do with my story sir philip when applied to told me that he paid an annuity regularly to an old woman named fitzgerald living at coldholme the village near starkey manor house whether she had any descendants he could not say one bleak march evening i came in sight of the place described at the beginning of my story i could hardly understand the rude dialect in which the direction to old bridget's house was given yo see yon furleets all ran together gave me no idea that i was to guide myself by the distant lights that shone in the windows of the hall occupied for the time by a farmer who held the post of steward while the squire now four or five and twenty was making the grand tour 
However, at last I reached Bridget's cottage, a low, moss-grown place. The palings that had once surrounded it were broken and gone, and the underwood of the forest came up to the walls and must have darkened the windows. It was about seven o'clock, not late to my London notions, but after knocking for some time at the door and receiving no reply, I was driven to conjecture that the occupant of the house was gone to bed. So I betook myself to the nearest church I had seen three miles back on the road I had come, sure that close to that I should find an inn of some kind. And early the next morning I set off back to Coldholm, by a field path which my host assured me I should find a shorter cut than the road I had taken the night before. It was a cold, sharp morning. My feet left prints in the sprinkling of hoar-frost that covered the ground. Nevertheless, I saw an old woman whom I instinctively suspected to be the object of my search, in the sheltered covert on one side of my path. I lingered and watched her. She must have been considerably above the middle size in her prime, for when she raised herself from the stooping position in which I first saw her, there was something fine and commanding in the erectness of her figure. She drooped again in a minute or two, and seemed looking for something on the ground, as, with bent head, she turned off from the spot where I gazed upon her, and was lost to my sight. I fancy I missed my way, and made a round in spite of the landlord's directions, for by the time I had reached Bridget's cottage she was there, with no semblance of hurried walk or discomposure of any kind. The door was slightly ajar. I knocked, and the majestic figure stood before me, silently waiting the explanation of my errand. Her teeth were all gone, so the nose and chin were brought near together. The grey eyebrows were straight and almost hung over her deep cavernous eyes, and the thick white hair lay in silvery masses over the low, wide, wrinkled forehead. For a moment I stood uncertain how to shape my answer to the solemn questioning of her silence. "'Your name is Bridget Fitzgerald, I believe?' She bowed her head in assent. "'I have something to say to you. May I come in? I am unwilling to keep you standing.' "'You cannot tire me.' she said, and at first she seemed inclined to deny me the shelter of her roof. But the next moment she had searched the very soul in me with her eyes during that instant, she led me in and dropped the shadowing hood of her grey draping cloak, which had previously hid part of the character of her countenance. The cottage was rude and bare enough, but before that picture of the Virgin, of which I have made mention, there stood a little cup filled with fresh primroses. While she paid her reverence to the Madonna, I understood why she had been out seeking through the clumps of green in the sheltered copse. Then she turned round and bade me be seated. The expression of her face, which all this time I was studying, was not bad, as the stories of my last night's landlord had led me to expect. It was a wild, stern, fierce, indomitable countenance, seamed and scarred by agonies of solitary weeping, but it was neither cunning nor malignant. "'My name is Bridget Fitzgerald,' said she, by way of opening our conversation. "'And your husband was Hugh Fitzgerald of Knockmahon, near Kildoon, in Ireland?' A faint light came into the dark gloom of her eyes. He was. May I ask if you had any children by him? The light in her eyes grew quick and red. She tried to speak, I could see, but something rose in her throat and choked her, and until she could speak calmly she would fain not speak at all before a stranger. In a minute or so she said, I had a daughter, one Mary Fitzgerald. Then her strong nature mastered her strong will, and she cried out with a trembling, wailing cry, O oh man, what of her, what of her? She rose from her seat, and came and clutched at my arm and looked in my eyes. There she read, as I suppose, 
my utter ignorance of what had become of her child for she went blindly back to her chair and sat rocking herself and softly moaning as if i were not there i not daring to speak to the lone and awful woman after a little pause she knelt down before the picture of our lady of the holy heart and spoke to her by all the fanciful and poetic names of the litany o rose of sharon o tower of david o star of the sea have you no comfort for my sore heart am i for ever to hope grant me at least despair and so on she went heedless of my presence her prayers grew wilder and wilder till they seemed to me to touch on the borders of madness and blasphemy almost involuntarily i spoke as if to stop her have you any reason to think that your daughter is dead she rose from her knees and came and stood before me mary fitzgerald is dead said she i shall never see her again in the flesh no tongue ever told me but i know she is dead i have yearned so to see her and my heart's will is fearful and strong it would have drawn her to me before now if she had been a wanderer on the other side of the world i wonder often it has not drawn her out of the grave to come and stand before me and hear me tell her how i loved her for sir we parted unfriends i knew nothing but the dry particulars needed for my lawyer's quest but i could not help feeling for the desolate woman and she must have read the unusual sympathy with her wistful eyes yes sir we did she never knew how i loved her and we parted unfriends and i fear me that i wished her voyage might not turn out well only meaning oh blessed virgin you know i only meant that she should come home to her mother's arms as to the happiest place on earth but my wishes are terrible their power goes beyond my thought and there is no hope for me if my words brought mary harm but i said you do not know that she is dead even now you hoped she might be alive listen to me and i told her the tale i have already told you giving it all in the driest manner for i wanted to recall the clear sense that i felt almost sure she had possessed in her younger days and by keeping up her attention to details restrained the vague wildness of her grief she listened with deep attention putting from time to time such questions as convinced me i had to do with no uncommon intelligence however dimmed and shorn by solitude and mysterious sorrow then she took up her tale and in few brief words told me of her wanderings abroad in vain search after her daughter sometimes in the wake of armies sometimes in camp sometimes in city the lady whose waiting woman mary had gone to be had died soon after the date of her last letter home her husband the foreign officer had been serving in hungary whither bridget had followed him but too late to find him vague rumours reached her that mary had made a great marriage and this sting of doubt was added whether the mother might not be close to her child under her new name and even hearing of her every day and yet never recognizing the lost one under the appellation she then bore at length the thought took possession of her that it was possible that all this time mary might be at home at coldholm in the trough of bolland in lancashire in england and home came bridget in that vain hope to her desolate hearth and empty cottage here she had thought it safest to remain if mary was in life it was here she would seek for her mother i noted down one or two particulars out of bridget's narrative that i thought might be of use to me for i was stimulated to further search in a strange and extraordinary manner it seemed as if it were impressed upon me that i must take up the quest where bridget had laid it down and this for no reason that had previously influenced me such as my uncle's anxiety on the subject my own reputation as a lawyer and so on 
but from some strange power which had taken possession of my will only that very morning and which forced it in the direction it chose i will go said i i will spare nothing in the search trust to me i will learn all that can be learnt you shall know all that money or pains or wit can discover it is true she may be long dead but she may have left a child a child she cried as if for the first time this idea had struck her mind hear him blessed virgin he says she may have left a child and you have never told me though i have prayed so for a sign waking or sleeping nay said i i know nothing but what you tell me you say you heard of her marriage but she caught nothing of what i said she was praying to the virgin in a kind of ecstasy which seemed to render her unconscious of my very presence from coldholm i went to sir philip tempest's the wife of the foreign officer had been a cousin of his father's and from him i thought i might gain some particulars as to the existence of the count de la tour d'auvergne and where i could find him for i knew questions de vive voix aid the flagging recollection and i was determined to lose no chance for want of trouble but sir philip had gone abroad and it would be some time before i could receive an answer so i followed my uncle's advice to whom i had mentioned how wearied i felt both in body and mind by my will-o'-the-wisp search he immediately told me to go to harrogate there to await sir philip's reply i should be near to one of the places connected with my search cold home not far from sir philip tempest in case he returned and i wished to ask him any further questions and in conclusion my uncle bade me try to forget all about my business for a time this was far easier said than done i have seen a child on a common blown along by a high wind without power of standing still and resisting the tempestuous force i was somewhat in the same predicament as regarded my mental state something resistless seemed to urge my thoughts on through every possible course by which there was a chance of attaining to my object i did not see the sweeping moors when i walked out when i held a book in my hand and read the words their sense did not penetrate to my brain if i slept i went on with the same ideas always flowing in the same direction this could not last long without having a bad effect on the body i had an illness which although i was racked with pain was a positive relief to me as it compelled me to live in the present suffering and not in the visionary researches i had been continually making before my kind uncle came to nurse me and after the immediate danger was over my life seemed to slip away in delicious languor for two or three months i did not ask so much did i dread falling into the old channel of thought whether any reply had been received to my letter to sir philip i turned my whole imagination right away from all that subject my uncle remained with me until nigh summer and then returned to his business in london leaving me perfectly well although not completely strong i was to follow him in a fortnight when as he said we would look over letters and talk about several things i knew what this little speech alluded to and shrank from the train of thought it suggested which was so intimately connected with my first feelings of illness however i had a fortnight more to roam on those invigorating yorkshire moors in those days there was one large rambling inn at harrogate close to the medicinal spring but it was already becoming too small for the accommodation of the influx of visitors and many lodged round about in the farmhouses of the district it was so early in the season that i had the inn pretty much to myself and indeed felt rather like a visitor in a private house so intimate had the landlord and landlady become with me during my long illness 
she would chide me for being out so late on the moors or for having been too long without food quite in a motherly way while he consulted me about vintages and wines and taught me many a yorkshire wrinkle about horses in my walks i met other strangers from time to time even before my uncle had left me i had noticed with half torpid curiosity a young lady of very striking appearance who went about always accompanied by an elderly companion hardly a gentlewoman but with something in her look that prepossessed me in her favour the younger lady always put her veil down when any one approached so it had been only once or twice when i had come upon her at a sudden turn in the path that i had even had a glimpse of her face i am not sure if it was beautiful though in after life i grew to think it so but it was at this time overshadowed by a sadness that never varied a pale quiet resigned look of intense suffering that irresistibly attracted me not with love but with a sense of infinite compassion for one so young yet so hopelessly unhappy the companion wore something of the same look quiet melancholy hopeless yet resigned i asked my landlord who they were he said they were called clark and wished to be considered as mother and daughter but that for his part he did not believe that to be their right name or that there was any such relationship between them they had been in the neighbourhood of harrogate for some time lodging in a remote farmhouse the people there would tell nothing about them saying that they paid handsomely and never did any harm so why should they be speaking of any strange things that might happen that as the landlord shrewdly observed showed there was something out of the common way he had heard that the elderly woman was a cousin of the farmers where they lodged and so the regard existing between relations might help to keep them quiet what did he think then was the reason for their extreme seclusion asked i nay he could not tell not he he had heard that the young lady for all as quiet as she seemed played strange pranks at times he shook his head when i asked him for more particulars and refused to give them which made me doubt if he knew any for he was in general a talkative and communicative man in default of other interests after my uncle left i set myself to watch these two people i hovered about their walks drawn towards them with a strange fascination which was not diminished by their evident annoyance at so frequently meeting me one day i had the sudden good fortune to be at hand when they were alarmed by the attack of a bull which in those unenclosed grazing districts was a particularly dangerous occurrence i have other and more important things to relate than to tell of the accident which gave me an opportunity of rescuing them it is enough to say that this event was the beginning of an acquaintance reluctantly acquiesced in by them but eagerly prosecuted by me i can hardly tell when intense curiosity became merged in love but in less than ten days after my uncle's departure i was passionately enamoured of mistress lucy as her attendant called her carefully for this i noted well avoiding any address which appeared as if there was an equality of station between them i noticed also that mrs clark the elderly woman after her first reluctance to allow me to pay them any attentions had been overcome was cheered by my evident attachment to the young girl it seemed to lighten her heavy burden of care and she evidently favoured my visits to the farmhouse where they lodged it was not so with lucy a more attractive person i never saw in spite of her depression of manner and shrinking avoidance of me i felt sure at once that whatever was the source of her grief it rose from no fault of her own it was difficult to draw her into conversation but when at times for a moment or two i beguiled her into talk i could see a rare intelligence in her face and a grave trusting look in the soft grey eyes that were raised for a minute to mine 
i made every excuse i possibly could for going there i sought wild flowers for lucy's sake i planned walks for lucy's sake i watched the heavens by night in hopes that some unusual beauty of sky would justify me in tempting mrs clark and lucy forth upon the moors to gaze at the great purple dome above it seemed to me that lucy was aware of my love but that for some motive which i could not guess she would fain have repelled me but then again i saw or fancied i saw that her heart spoke in my favour and that there was a struggle going on in her mind which at times i loved so dearly i could have begged her to spare herself even though the happiness of my whole life should have been the sacrifice for her complexion grew paler her aspect of sorrow more hopeless her delicate frame yet slighter during this period i had written i should say to my uncle to beg to be allowed to prolong my stay at harrogate not giving any reason but such was his tenderness towards me that in a few days i heard from him giving me a willing permission and only charging me to take care of myself and not use too much exertion during the hot weather one sultry evening i drew near the farm the windows of their parlour were open and i heard voices when i turned the corner of the house as i passed the first window there were two windows in their little ground floor room i saw lucy distinctly but when i had knocked at their door the house door stood always ajar she was gone and i only saw mrs clark turning over the work things lying on the table in a nervous and purposeless manner i felt by instinct that a conversation of some importance was coming on in which i should be expected to say what was my object in paying these frequent visits i was glad of the opportunity my uncle had several times alluded to the pleasant possibility of my bringing home a young wife to cheer and adorn the old house in ormond street he was rich and i was to succeed him and had as i knew a fair reputation for so young a lawyer so on my side i saw no obstacle it was true that lucy was shrouded in mystery her name i was convinced it was not clark birth parentage and previous life were unknown to me but i was sure of her goodness and sweet innocence and although i knew that there must be something painful to be told to account for her mournful sadness yet i was willing to bear my share of her grief whatever it might be mrs clark began as if it was a relief to her to plunge into the subject we have thought sir at least i have thought that you know very little of us nor we of you indeed not enough to warrant the intimate acquaintance we have fallen into i beg your pardon sir she went on nervously i am but a plain kind of woman and i mean to use no rudeness but i must say straight out that i we think it would be better for you not to come so often to see us she is very unprotected and why should i not come to see you dear madam asked i eagerly glad of the opportunity of explaining myself i come i own because i have learnt to love mistress lucy and wish to teach her to love me mistress clark shook her head and sighed don't sir neither love her nor for the sake of all you hold sacred teach her to love you if i am too late and you love her already forget her forget these last few weeks oh i should never have allowed you to come she went on passionately but what am i to do we are forsaken by all except the great god and even he permits a strange and evil power to afflict us what am i to do where is it to end she wrung her hands in her distress then she turned to me go away sir go away before you learn to care any more for her i ask it for your own sake i implore you have been good and kind to us and we shall always recollect you with gratitude but go away now and never come back to cross our fatal path indeed madam said i i shall do no such thing 
you urge it for my own sake i have no fear so urged nor wish except to hear more all i cannot have seen mistress lucy in all the intimacy of this last fortnight without acknowledging her goodness and innocence and without seeing pardon me madam that for some reason you are two very lonely women in some mysterious sorrow and distress now though i am not powerful myself yet i have friends who are so wise and kind that they may be said to possess power tell me some particulars why are you in grief what is your secret why are you here i declare solemnly that nothing you have said has daunted me in my wish to become lucy's husband nor will i shrink from any difficulty that as such an aspirant i may have to encounter you say you are friendless why cast away an honest friend i will tell you of people to whom you may write and who will answer any questions as to my character and prospects i do not shun inquiry she shook her head again you had better go away sir you know nothing about us i know your names said i and i have heard you allude to the part of the country from which you came which i happen to know as a wild and lonely place there are so few people living in it that if i chose to go there i could easily ascertain all about you but i would rather hear it from yourself you see i wanted to pique her into telling me something definite you do not know our true name sir said she hastily well i may have conjectured as much but tell me then i conjure you give me your reasons for distrusting my willingness to stand by what i have said with regard to mistress lucy oh what can i do exclaimed she if i am turning away a true friend as he says stay coming to a sudden decision i will tell you something i cannot tell you all you would not believe it but perhaps i can tell you enough to prevent your going on in your hopeless attachment i am not lucy's mother so i conjectured i said go on i do not even know whether she is the legitimate or illegitimate child of her father but he is cruelly turned against her and her mother is long dead and for a terrible reason she has no other creature to keep constant to her but me she only two years ago such a darling and such a pride in her father's house why sir there is a mystery that might happen in connection with her any moment and then you would go away like all the rest and when you next heard her name you would loathe her others who have loved her longer have done so before now my poor child whom neither god nor man has mercy upon or surely she would die the good woman was stopped by her crying i confess i was a little stunned by her last words but only for a moment at any rate till i knew definitely what this mysterious stain upon one so simple and pure as lucy seemed i would not desert her and so i said and she made answer if you are daring in your heart to think harm of my child sir after knowing her as you have done you are no good man yourself but i am so foolish and helpless in my great sorrow that i would fain hope to find a friend in you i cannot help trusting that although you may no longer feel towards her as a lover you will have pity upon us and perhaps by your learning you can tell us where to go for aid i implore you tell me what this mystery is i cried almost maddened by this suspense i cannot said she solemnly i am under a deep vow of secrecy if you are to be told it must be by her she left the room and i remained to ponder over the strange interview i mechanically turned over the few books and with eyes that saw nothing at the time examined the tokens of lucy's frequent presence in that room when i got home at night i remembered how all these trifles spoke of a pure and tender heart and innocent life mistress clark returned she had been crying sadly 
Yes, said she, it is as I feared. She loves you so much that she is willing to run the fearful risk of telling you all herself. She acknowledges it is but a poor chance, but your sympathy will be a balm if you give it. Tomorrow come here at ten in the morning, and as you hope for pity in your hour of agony, repress all show of fear or repugnance you may feel towards one so grievously afflicted. I half smiled. Have no fear, I said. It seemed too absurd to imagine my feeling dislike to Lucy. Her father loved her well, said she gravely, yet he drove her out like some monstrous thing. Just at this moment came a peal of ringing laughter from the garden. It was Lucy's voice. It sounded as if she were standing just on one side of the open casement, and as though she were suddenly stirred to merriment, merriment verging on boisterousness by the doings or sayings of some other person. I can scarcely say why, but the sound jarred on me inexpressibly. She knew the subject of our conversation, and must have been at least aware of the state of agitation her friend was in. She herself usually so gentle and quiet. I half rose to go to the window, and satisfy my instinctive curiosity as to what had provoked this burst of ill-timed laughter. But Mrs. Clark threw her whole weight and power upon the hand with which she pressed and kept me down. For God's sake, she said, white and trembling all over, sit still, be quiet. Oh, be patient. Tomorrow you will know all. Leave us, for we are all sorely afflicted. Do not seek to know more about us. Again that laugh, so musical in sound, yet so discordant to my heart. She held me tight, tighter, without positive violence I could not have risen. I was sitting with my back to the window, but I felt a shadow pass between the sun's warmth and me, and a strange shudder ran through my frame. In a minute or two she released me. Go, repeated she, be warned, I ask you once more. I do not think you can stand this knowledge that you seek. If I had had my own way, Lucy should never have yielded and promised to tell you all. Who knows what may come of it? I am firm in my wish to know all. I return at ten tomorrow morning, and then expect to see Mistress Lucy herself. I turned away, having my own suspicions, I confess, as to Mistress Clark's sanity. The Poor Clare, Part 3 Conjectures as to the meaning of her hints, and uncomfortable thoughts connected with that strange laughter, filled my mind. I could hardly sleep. I rose early, and long before the hour I had appointed, I was on the path over the common that led to the old farmhouse where they lodged. I suppose that Lucy had passed no better a night than I, for there she was also, slowly pacing with her even step, her eyes bent down, her whole look most saintly and pure. She started when I came close to her, and grew paler as I reminded her of my appointment, and spoke with something of the impatience of obstacles that, seeing her once more, had called up afresh in my mind. All strange and terrible hints and giddy merriment were forgotten. My heart gave forth words of fire, and my tongue uttered them. Her colour went and came, as she listened, but, when I had ended my passionate speeches, she lifted her soft eyes to me and said, But you know that you have something to learn about me yet. I only want to say this. I shall not think less of you, less well of you, I mean, if you too fall away from me when you know all. Stop, said she, as if fearing another burst of mad words. Listen to me. My father is a man of great wealth. I never knew my mother. She must have died when I was very young. When first I remember anything, I was living in a great lonely house with my dear and faithful Mistress Clark. 
my father even was not there he was he is a soldier and his duties lie abroad but he came from time to time and every time i think he loved me more and more he brought me rarities from foreign lands which proved to me now how much he must have thought of me during his absences i can sit down and measure the depth of his love now by such standards as these i never thought whether he loved me or not then it was so natural that it was like the air i breathed yet he was an angry man at times even then but never with me he was very reckless too and once or twice i heard a whisper among the servants that a doom was over him and that he knew it and tried to drown his knowledge in wild activity and even sometimes sir in wine so i grew up in this grand mansion in that lonely place everything around me seemed at my disposal and i think everyone loved me i am sure loved them till about two years ago i remember it well my father had come to england to us and he seemed so proud and so pleased with me and all i had done and one day his tongue seemed loosened with wine and he told me much that i had not known till then how dearly he had loved my mother yet how his wilful usage had caused her death and then he went on to say how he loved me better than any creature on earth and how some day he hoped to take me to foreign places for that he could hardly bear these long absences from his only child then he seemed to change suddenly and said in a strange wild way that i was not to believe what he said that there was many a thing he loved better his horse his dog i know not what and twas only the next morning that when i came into his room to ask his blessing as was my wont he received me with fierce and angry words why had i so he asked been delighting myself in such wanton mischief dancing over the tender plants in the flower-beds all set with the famous dutch bulbs he had brought from holland i had never been out of doors that morning sir and i could not conceive what he meant and so i said and then he swore at me for a liar and said i was of no true blood for he had seen me doing all that mischief himself with his own eyes what could i say he would not listen to me and even my tears seemed only to irritate him that day was the beginning of my great sorrows not long after he reproached me for my undue familiarity all unbecoming a gentlewoman with his grooms i had been in the stable yard laughing and talking he said now sir i am something of a coward by nature and i had always dreaded horses besides that my father's servants those whom he brought with him from foreign parts were wild fellows whom i had always avoided and to whom i had never spoken except as a lady must needs from time to time speak to her father's people yet my father called me by names of which i hardly know the meaning but my heart told me they were such as shame any modest woman and from that day he turned quite against me nay sir not many weeks after that he came in with a riding-whip in his hand and accusing me harshly of evil doings of which i knew no more than you sir he was about to strike me and i all in bewildering tears was ready to take his stripes as great kindnesses compared to his harder words when suddenly he stopped his arm midway gasped and staggered crying out the curse the curse i looked up in terror in the great mirror opposite i saw myself and right behind another wicked fearful self so like me that my soul seemed to quiver within me as though not knowing to which similitude of body it belonged my father saw my double at the same moment either in its dreadful reality whatever that might be or in that scarcely less terrible reflection in the mirror but what came of it at that moment i cannot say for i suddenly swooned away and when i came to myself i was lying in my bed and my faithful clerk sitting by me i was in my bed for days and even while i lay there my double was seen by all flitting about the house and gardens 
always about some mischievous or detestable work what wonder that every one shrank from me in dread that my father drove me forth at length when the disgrace of which i was the cause was past his patience to bear mistress clark came with me and here we try to live such a life of piety and prayer as may in time set me free from the curse all the time she had been speaking i had been weighing her story in my mind i had hitherto put cases of witchcraft on one side as mere superstitions and my uncle and i had had many an argument he supporting himself by the opinion of his good friend sir matthew hale yet this sounded like the tale of one bewitched or was it merely the effect of a life of extreme seclusion telling on the nerves of a sensitive girl my scepticism inclined me to the latter belief and when she paused i said i fancy that some physician could have disabused your father of his belief in visions just at that instant standing as i was opposite to her in the full and perfect morning light i saw behind her another figure a ghastly semblance complete in likeness so far as form and feature and minutest touch of dress could go but with a loathsome demon soul looking out of the grey eyes that were in turns mocking and voluptuous my heart stood still within me every hair rose up erect my flesh crept with horror i could not see the grave and tender lucy my eyes were fascinated by the creature beyond i know not why but i put out my hand to clutch it i grasped nothing but empty air and my whole blood curdled to ice for a moment i could not see then my sight came back and i saw lucy standing before me alone deathly pale and i could have fancied almost shrunk in size it has been near me she said as if asking a question the sound seemed taken out of her voice it was husky as the notes of an old harpsichord when the strings have ceased to vibrate she read her answer in my face i suppose for i could not speak her look was one of intense fear but that died away into an aspect of most humble patience at length she seemed to force herself to face behind and around her she saw the purple moors the blue distant hills quivering in the sunlight but nothing else will you take me home she said meekly i took her by the hand and led her silently through the budding heather we dared not speak for we could not tell but that the dread creature was listening although unseen but that it might appear and push us asunder i never loved her more fondly than now when and that was the unspeakable misery the idea of her was becoming so inextricably blended with the shuddering thought of it she seemed to understand what i must be feeling she let go my hand which she had kept clasped until then when we reached the garden gate and went forward to meet her anxious friend who was standing by the window looking for her i could not enter the house i needed silence society leisure change i knew not what to shake off the sensation of that creature's presence yet i lingered about the garden i hardly know why i partly suppose because i feared to encounter the resemblance again on the solitary common where it had vanished and partly from a feeling of inexpressible compassion for lucy in a few minutes mistress clark came forth and joined me we walked some paces in silence you know all now said she solemnly i saw it said i below my breath and you shrink from us now said she with a hopelessness which stirred up all that was brave or good in me not a whit said i human flesh shrinks from encounter with the powers of darkness and for some reason unknown to me the pure and holy lucy is their victim the sins of the fathers shall be visited upon the children said she who is her father asked i knowing as much as i do i may surely know more know all tell me i entreat you madam all that you can conjecture respecting this demonic persecution of one so good i will but not now i must go to lucy now 
come this afternoon i will see you alone and oh sir i will trust that you may yet find some way to help us in our sore trouble i was miserably exhausted by the swooning affright which had taken possession of me when i reached the inn i staggered in like one overcome by wine i went to my own private room it was some time before i saw that the weekly post had come in and brought me my letters there was one from my uncle one from my home in devonshire and one redirected over the first address sealed with a great coat of arms it was from sir philip tempest my letter of inquiry respecting mary fitzgerald had reached him at liege where it so happened that the count de la tour d'auvergne was quartered at the very time he remembered his wife's beautiful attendant she had had high words with the deceased countess respecting her intercourse with an english gentleman of good standing who was also in the foreign service the countess augured evil of his intentions while mary proud and vehement asserted that he would soon marry her and resented her mistress's warnings as an insult the consequence was that she had left madame de la tour d'auvergne's service and as the count believed had gone to live with the englishman whether he had married her or not he could not say but added sir philip tempest you may easily hear what particulars you wish to know respecting mary fitzgerald from the englishman himself if as i suspect he is no other than my neighbour and former acquaintance mr gisborne of skipford hall in the west riding i am led to the belief that he is no other by several small particulars none of which are in themselves conclusive but which taken together make a mass of presumptive evidence as far as i could make out from the count's foreign pronunciation gisborne was the name of the englishman i know that gisborne of skipford was abroad and in the foreign service at that time he was a likely fellow enough for such an exploit and above all certain expressions recur to my mind which he used in reference to old bridget fitzgerald of cold home whom he once encountered while staying with me at starkey manor house i remember that the meeting seemed to have produced some extraordinary effect upon his mind as though he had suddenly discovered some connection which she might have had with his previous life i beg you to let me know if i can be of any further service to you your uncle once rendered me a good turn and i will gladly repay it so far as in me lies to his nephew so i was now apparently close on the discovery which i had striven so many months to attain but success had lost its zest i put my letters down and seemed to forget them all in thinking of the morning i had passed that very day nothing was real but the unreal presence which had come like an evil blast across my bodily eyes and burnt itself down upon my brain dinner came and went away untouched early in the afternoon i walked to the farmhouse i found mistress clark alone and i was glad and relieved she was evidently prepared to tell me all i might wish to hear you asked me for mistress lucy's true name it is gisborne she began not gisborne of skipford i exclaimed breathless with anticipation the same said she quietly not regarding my manner her father is a man of note although being a roman catholic he cannot take that rank in this country to which his station entitles him the consequence is that he lives much abroad has been a soldier i am told and lucy's mother i asked she shook her head i never knew her said she lucy was about three years old when i was engaged to take charge of her her mother was dead but you know her name you can tell if it was mary fitzgerald she looked astonished that was her name but sir how came you to be so well acquainted with it it was a mystery to the whole household at skipford court she was some beautiful young woman whom he lured away from her protectors while he was abroad i have heard said he practised some terrible deceit upon her and when she came to know it she was neither to have nor to hold 
but rushed off from his very arms and threw herself into a rapid stream and was drowned it stung him deep with remorse but i used to think the remembrance of the mother's cruel death made him love the child yet dearer i told her as briefly as might be of my researches after the descendant and heir of the fitzgeralds of kildoon and added something of my old lawyer spirit returning into me for the moment that i had no doubt but that we should prove lucy to be by right possessed of large estates in ireland no flush came over her grey face no light into her eyes and what is all the wealth in the world to that poor girl said she it will not free her from the ghastly bewitchment which persecutes her as for money what a pitiful thing it is it cannot touch her no more can the evil creature harm her i said her holy nature dwells apart and cannot be defiled or stained by all the devilish arts in the whole world true but it is a cruel fate to know that all shrink from her sooner or later as from one possessed accursed how came it to pass i asked nay i know not old rumours there are that were bruited through the household at skipford tell me i demanded they came from servants who would fain account for everything they say that many years ago mr gisborne killed a dog belonging to an old witch at coldholm that she cursed with a dreadful and mysterious curse the creature whatever it might be that he should love best and that it struck so deeply into his heart that for years he kept himself aloof from any temptation to love aught but who could help loving lucy you never heard the witch's name i gasped yes they called her bridget they said he would never go near the spot again for terror of her yet he was a brave man listen said i taking hold of her arm the better to arrest her full attention if what i suspect holds true that man stole bridget's only child the very mary fitzgerald who was lucy's mother if so bridget cursed him in ignorance of the deeper wrong he had done her to this hour she yearns after her lost child and questions the saints whether she be living or not the roots of that curse lie deeper than she knows she unwittingly banned him for a deeper guilt than that of killing a dumb beast the sins of the fathers are indeed visited upon the children but said mistress clark eagerly she would never let evil rest on her own grandchild surely sir if what you say be true there are hopes for lucy let us go go at once and tell this fearful woman all that you suspect and beseech her to take off the spell she has put upon her innocent grandchild it seemed to me indeed that something like this was the best course we could pursue but first it was necessary to ascertain more than what mere rumour or careless hearsay could tell my thoughts turned to my uncle he could advise me wisely he ought to know all i resolved to go to him without delay but i did not choose to tell mistress clark of all the visionary plans that flitted through my mind i simply declared my intention of proceeding straight to london on lucy's affairs i bade her believe that my interest on the young lady's behalf was greater than ever and that my whole time should be given up to her cause i saw that mistress clark distrusted me because my mind was too full of thoughts for my words to flow freely she sighed and shook her head and said well it is all right in such a tone that it was an implied reproach but i was firm and constant in my heart and i took confidence from that i rode to london i rode long days drawn out into lovely summer nights i could not rest i reached london i told my uncle all though in the stir of the great city the horror had faded away and i could hardly imagine that he would believe the account i gave him of the fearful double of lucy which i had seen on the lonely moorside but my uncle had lived many years and learnt many things and in the deep secrets of family history that had been confided to him 
he had heard of cases of innocent people bewitched and taken possession of by evil spirits yet more fearful than lucy's for as he said to judge from all i told him that resemblance had no power over her she was too pure and good to be tainted by its evil haunting presence it had in all probability so my uncle conceived tried to suggest wicked thoughts and to tempt to wicked actions but she in her saintly maidenhood had passed on undefiled by evil thought or deed it could not touch her soul but true it set her apart from all sweet love or common human intercourse my uncle threw himself with an energy more like six-and-twenty than sixty into the consideration of the whole case he undertook the proving lucy's descent and volunteered to go and find out mr gisborne and obtain firstly the legal proofs of her descent from the fitzgeralds of kildoon and secondly to try and hear all that he could respecting the workings of the curse and whether any and what means had been taken to exorcise that terrible appearance for he told me of instances where by prayers and long fasting the evil possessor had been driven forth with howling and many cries from the body which it had come to inhabit he spoke of those strange new england cases which had happened not so long ago of mr defoe who had written a book wherein he had named many modes of subduing apparitions and sending them back whence they came and lastly he spoke low of dreadful ways of compelling witches to undo their witchcraft but i could not endure to hear of those tortures and burnings i said that bridget was rather a wild and savage woman than a malignant witch and above all that lucy was of her kith and kin and that in putting her to the trial by water or by fire we should be torturing it might be to the death the ancestress of her we sought to redeem my uncle thought a while and then said that in this last matter i was right at any rate at any rate it should not be tried with his consent till all other modes of remedy had failed and he assented to my proposal that i should go myself and see bridget and tell her all in accordance with this i went down once more to the wayside inn near coldholm it was late at night when i arrived there and while i supped i inquired of the landlord more particulars as to bridget's ways solitary and savage had been her life for many years wild and despotic were her words and manner to those few people who came across her path the country folk did her imperious bidding because they feared to disobey if they pleased her they prospered if on the contrary they neglected or traversed her behests misfortune small or great fell on them and theirs it was not detestation so much as an indefinable terror that she excited in the morning i went to see her she was standing on the green outside her cottage and received me with the sullen grandeur of a throneless queen i read in her face that she recognized me and that i was not unwelcome but she stood silent till i had opened my errand i have news of your daughter said i resolved to speak straight to all that i knew she felt of love and not to spare her she is dead the stern figure scarcely trembled but her hand sought the support of the doorpost i knew that she was dead said she deep and low and then was silent for an instant my tears that should have flowed for her were burnt up long years ago young man tell me about her not yet said i having a strange power given me of confronting one whom nevertheless in my secret soul i dreaded you had once a little dog i continued the words called out in her more show of emotion than the intelligence of her daughter's death she broke in upon my speech i had it was hers the last thing i had of hers and it was shot for wantonness it died in my arms the man who killed that dog rues it to this day for that dumb beast's blood his best beloved stands accursed 
her eyes distended as if she were in a trance and saw the working of her curse again i spoke o oh, woman i said that best beloved standing accursed before men is your dead daughter's child the life the energy the passion came back to the eyes with which she pierced through me to see if i spoke truth then without another question or word she threw herself on the ground with fearful vehemence and clutched at the innocent daisies with convulsed hands bone of my bone flesh of my flesh have i cursed thee and art thou accursed so she moaned as she lay prostrate in her great agony i stood aghast at my own work she did not hear my broken sentences she asked no more but the dumb confirmation which my sad looks had given that one fact that her curse rested on her own daughter's child the fear grew on me lest she should die in her strife of body and soul and then might not lucy remain under the spell as long as she lived even at this moment i saw lucy coming through the woodland path that led to bridget's cottage mistress clark was with her i felt at my heart that it was she by the balmy peace which the look of her sent over me as she slowly advanced a glad surprise shining out of her soft quiet eyes that was as her gaze met mine as her looks fell on the woman lying stiff convulsed on the earth they became full of tender pity she came forward to try and lift her up seating herself on the turf she took bridget's head into her lap and with gentle touches she arranged the dishevelled grey hair streaming thick and wild from beneath her much god help her murmured lucy how she suffers at her desire we sought for water but when we returned bridget had recovered her wandering senses and was kneeling with clasped hands before lucy gazing at that sweet sad face as though her troubled nature drank in health and peace from every moment's contemplation a faint tinge on lucy's pale cheeks showed me she was aware of our return otherwise it appeared as if she was conscious of her influence for good over the passion and troubled woman kneeling before her and would not willingly avert her grave and loving eyes from that wrinkled and careworn countenance suddenly in the twinkling of an eye the creature appeared there behind lucy fearfully the same as to outward semblance but kneeling exactly as bridget knelt and clasping her hands in jesting mimicry as bridget clasped hers in her ecstasy that was deepening into a prayer mistress clark cried out bridget arose slowly her gaze fixed on the creature beyond drawing her breath with a hissing sound never moving her terrible eyes that were steady as stone she made a dart at the phantom and caught as i had done a mere handful of empty air we saw no more of the creature it vanished as suddenly as it came but bridget looked slowly on as if watching some receding form lucy sat still white trembling drooping I think she would have swooned if I had not been there to uphold her. While I was attending to her, Bridget passed us without a word to anyone, and entering her cottage she barred herself in and left us without. All our endeavours were now directed to get Lucy back to the house where she had tarried the night before. Mistress Clark told me that, not hearing from me, some letter must have miscarried, she had grown impatient and despairing and had urged lucy to the enterprise of coming to seek her grandmother not telling her indeed of the dread reputation she possessed or how we suspected her of having so fearfully blighted that innocent girl but at the same time hoping much from the mysterious stirrings of blood which mistress clark trusted in for the removal of the curse they had come by a different route from that which i had taken to a village inn not far from cold home only the night before this was the first interview between ancestress and descendant all through the sultry noon i wandered along the tangled wood paths of the old neglected forest thinking where to turn for remedy in a matter so complicated and mysterious 
meeting a countryman i asked my way to the nearest clergyman and went hoping to obtain some counsel from him but he proved to be a coarse and common-minded man giving no time or attention to the intricacies of a case but dashing out a strong opinion involving immediate action for instance as soon as i named bridget fitzgerald he exclaimed the cold home which the irish papist i'd have had a duck long since but for that other papist sir philip tempest he has had to threaten honest folk about here over and over again or they'd have had her up before the justices for her black doings and it's the law of the land that witches should be burnt ay and of scriptures too sir yet you see a papist if he's a rich squire can overrule both law and scripture i'd carry a faggot myself to rid the country of her such a one could give me no help i rather drew back what i had already said and tried to make the parson forget it by treating him to several pots of beer in the village inn to which we had adjourned for our conference at his suggestion i left him as soon as i could and returned to coldholme shaping my way past deserted starkey manor house and coming upon it by the back at that side were the oblong remains of the old moat the waters of which lay placid and motionless under the crimson rays of the setting sun with the forest trees lying straight along each side and their deep green foliage mirrored to blackness in the burnished surface of the moat below and the broken sundial at the end nearest the hall and the heron standing on one leg at the water's edge lazily looking down for fish the lonely and desolate house scarce needed the broken windows the weeds on the door sill the broken shutter softly flapping to and fro in the twilight breeze to fill up the picture of desertion and decay i lingered about the place until the growing darkness warned me on and then i passed along the path cut by the orders of the last lady of starkey manor house that led me to bridget's cottage i resolved at once to see her and in spite of closed doors it might be of resolved will she should see me so i knocked at her door gently loudly fiercely i shook it so vehemently that at length the old hinges gave way and with a crash it fell inwards leaving me suddenly face to face with bridget i red heated agitated with my so long baffled efforts she stiff as any stone standing right facing me her eyes dilated with terror her ashen lips trembling but her body motionless in her hands she held her crucifix as if by that holy symbol she sought to oppose my entrance at sight of me her whole frame relaxed and she sank back upon a chair some mighty tension had given way still her eyes looked fearfully into the gloom of the outer air made more opaque by the glimmer of the lamp inside which she had placed before the picture of the virgin is she there asked bridget hoarsely no who i am alone you remember me yes replied she still terror-stricken but she that creature has been looking in upon me through that window all day long i closed it up with my shawl and then i saw her feet below the door as long as it was light and i knew she heard my very breathing nay worse my very prayers and i could not pray for her listening choked the words ere they rose to my lips tell me who is she what means that double girl i saw this morning one had a look of my dead mary but the other curdled my blood and yet it was the same she had taken hold of my arm as if to secure herself some human companionship she shook all over with the slight never-ceasing tremor of intense terror i told her my tale as i have told it you sparing none of the details how mistress clark had informed me that the resemblance had driven lucy forth from her father's house how i had disbelieved until with mine own eyes i had seen another lucy standing behind my lucy the same in form and feature but with the demon soul looking out of its eyes 
I told her all, I say, believing that she, whose curse was working so upon the life of her innocent grandchild, was the only person who could find the remedy and the redemption. When I had done, she sat silent for many minutes. "'You love Mary's child?' she asked. "'I do, in spite of the fearful workings of the curse. I love her, yet I shrink from her ever since that day on the moorside. And men must shrink from one so accompanied. Friends and lovers must stand afar off. Oh, Bridget Fitzgerald, loosen the curse, set her free. Where is she? I eagerly caught at the idea that her presence was needed, in order that, by some strange prayer or exorcism, the spell might be reversed. I will go and bring her to you, I exclaimed. But Bridget tightened her hold upon my arm. Not so, said she in a low, hoarse voice. It would kill me to see her again, as I saw her this morning. And I must live till I have worked my work. Leave me, said she suddenly, and again taking up the cross. I defy the demon I have called up. Leave me to wrestle with it. She stood up as if in an ecstasy of inspiration from which all fear was banished. I lingered, why I can hardly tell, until once more she bade me be gone. As I went along the forest way, I looked back and saw her planting the cross in the empty threshold where the door had been. The next morning Lucy and I went to seek her, to bid her join her prayers with ours. The cottage stood open and wide to our gaze. No human being was there. The cross remained on the threshold, but Bridget was gone. The Poor Clare, Part 4 What was to be done next, was the question that I asked myself. As for Lucy, she would fain have submitted to the doom that lay upon her, her gentleness and piety, under the pressure of so horrible a life, seemed over-passive to me. She never complained. Mrs. Clark complained more than ever. As for me, I was more in love with the real Lucy than ever, but I shrunk from the false similitude with an intensity proportioned to my love. I found out by instinct that Mrs. Clark had occasional temptations to leave Lucy. The good lady's nerves were shaken and from what she said i could almost have concluded that the object of the double was to drive away from lucy this last and almost earliest friend at times i could scarcely bear to own it but i myself felt inclined to turn recreant and i would accuse lucy of being too patient too resigned one after another she won the little children of cold home Mrs. Clark and she had resolved to stay there, for was it not as good a place as any other to such as they? And did not all our faint hopes rest on Bridget, never seen or heard of now, but still we trusted to come back or give some token? So as I say, one after another, the little children came about my Lucy, won by her soft tones and her gentle smiles and kind actions. Alas! One after another they fell away, and shrunk from her path with blanching terror, and we too surely guessed the reason why. It was the last drop. I could bear it no longer. I resolved no more to linger around the spot, but to go back to my uncle, and among the learned divines of the City of London, seek for some power whereby to annul the curse. My uncle, meanwhile, had obtained all the requisite testimonials relating to Lucy's descent and birth, from the Irish lawyers and from Mr. Gisborne. The latter gentleman had written from abroad. He was again serving in the Austrian army. A letter alternately passionately self-reproachful and stoically repellent. It was evident that when he thought of Mary, her short life, how he had wronged her, and of her violent death, he could hardly find words severe enough for his own conduct, and from this point of view the curse that Bridget had laid upon him and his was regarded by him as a prophetic doom, to the utterance of which she was moved by a higher power, 
working for the fulfilment of a deeper vengeance than for the death of the poor dog but then again when he came to speak of his daughter the repugnance which the conduct of the demoniac creature had produced in his mind was but ill disguised under a show of profound indifference as to lucy's fate one almost felt as if he would have been as content to put her out of existence as he would have been to destroy some disgusting reptile that had invaded his chamber or his couch the great fitzgerald property was lucy's and that was all was nothing my uncle and i sat in the gloom of a london november evening in our house in ormond street i was out of health and felt as if i were in an inextricable coil of misery lucy and i wrote to each other but that was little and we dared not see each other for dread of the fearful third who had more than once taken her place at our meetings my uncle had on the day i speak of bidden prayers to be put up on the ensuing sabbath in many a church and meeting-house in london for one grievously tormented by an evil spirit he had faith in prayers i had none i was fast losing faith in all things so we sat he trying to interest me in the old talk of other days i oppressed by one thought when our old servant anthony opened the door and without speaking showed in a very gentlemanly and prepossessing man who had something remarkable about his dress betraying his profession to be that of the roman catholic priesthood he glanced at my uncle first then at me it was to me he bowed i did not give my name said he because you would hardly have recognized it unless sir when in the north you heard of father bernard the chaplain of stonyhurst i remembered afterwards that i had heard of him but at the time i had utterly forgotten it so i professed myself a complete stranger to him while my ever hospitable uncle although hating a papist as much as it was in his nature to hate anything placed a chair for the visitor and bade anthony bring glasses and a fresh jug of claret father bernard received this courtesy with the graceful ease and pleasant acknowledgment which belongs to the man of the world then he turned to scan me with his keen glance after some slight conversation entered into on his part i am certain with an intention of discovering on what terms of confidence i stood with my uncle he paused and said gravely i am sent here with a message to you sir from a woman to whom you have shown kindness and who is one of my penitents in antwerp one bridget fitzgerald bridget fitzgerald exclaimed i in antwerp tell me sir all that you can about her there is much to be said he replied but may i inquire if this gentleman if your uncle is acquainted with the particulars of which you and i stand informed all that i know he knows said i eagerly laying my hand on my uncle's arm as he made a motion as if to quit the room then i have to speak before two gentlemen who however they may differ from me in faith are yet fully impressed with the fact that there are evil powers going about continually to take cognizance of our evil thoughts and if their master gives them power to bring them into overt action such is my theory of the nature of that sin of which i dare not disbelieve as some sceptics would have us do the sin of witchcraft of this deadly sin you and i are aware bridget fitzgerald has been guilty since you saw her last many prayers have been offered in our churches many masses sung many penances undergone in order that if god and the holy saints so willed it her sin might be blotted out but it has not been so willed explain to me said i who you are and how you come connected with bridget why is she at antwerp i pray you sir tell me more if i am impatient excuse me i am ill and feverish and in consequence bewildered there was something to me inexpressibly soothing 
in the tone of voice with which he began to narrate as it were from the beginning his acquaintance with bridget i had known mr and mrs starkey during their residence abroad and so it fell out naturally that when i came as chaplain to the sherborns at stonyhurst our acquaintance was renewed and thus i became the confessor of the whole family isolated as they were from the officers of the church sherborne being their nearest neighbour who professed the true faith of course you are aware that facts revealed in confession are sealed as in the grave but i learnt enough of bridget's character to be convinced that i had to do with no common woman one powerful for good as for evil i believe that i was able to give her spiritual assistance from time to time and that she looked upon me as a servant of that holy church which has such wonderful power of moving men's hearts and relieving them of the burden of their sins i have known her cross the moors on the wildest night of storms to confess and be absolved and then she would return calmed and subdued to her daily work about her mistress no one witting where she had been during the hours that most passed in sleep upon their beds after her daughter's departure after mary's mysterious disappearance i had to impose many a long penance in order to wash away the sin of impatient repining that was fast leading her into the deeper guilt of blasphemy she set out on that long journey of which you have possibly heard that fruitless journey in search of mary and during her absence my superiors ordered my return to my former duties at antwerp and for many years i heard no more of bridget not many months ago as i was passing homeward in the evening along one of the streets near st jacques leading into the mere strait i saw a woman sitting crouched up under the shrine of the holy mother of sorrows her hood was drawn over her head so that the shadow caused by the light of the lamp above fell deep over her face her hands were clasped round her knees it was evident that she was someone in hopeless trouble and as such it was my duty to stop and speak i naturally addressed her first in flemish believing her to be one of the lower class of inhabitants she shook her head but did not look up then i tried french and she replied in that language but speaking it so indifferently that i was sure she was either english or irish and consequently spoke to her in my own native tongue she recognized my voice and starting up caught at my robes dragging me before the blessed shrine and throwing herself down and forcing me as much by her evident desire as by her action to kneel beside her she exclaimed o holy virgin you will never hearken to me again but hear him for you know him of old that he does your bidding and strives to heal broken hearts hear him she turned to me she will hear you if you will only pray she never hears me she and all the saints in heaven cannot hear my prayers for the evil one carries them off as he carried that first away oh father bernard pray for me i prayed for one in sore distress of what nature i could not say but the holy virgin would know bridget held me fast grasping with eagerness at the sound of my words when i had ended i rose and making the sign of the cross over her i was going to bless her in the name of the holy church when she shrank away like some terrified creature and said i am guilty of deadly sin and am not shriven arise my daughter said i and come with me and i led the way into one of the confessionals of st jacques she knelt i listened no words came the evil powers had stricken her dumb as i heard afterwards they had many a time before when she approached confession she was too poor to pay for the necessary forms of exorcism and hitherto those priests to whom she had addressed herself were either so ignorant of the meaning of her broken french or her irish english or else esteemed her to be one crazed as indeed her wild and excited manner might easily have led any one to think that they had neglected the sole means of loosening her tongue 
so that she might confess her deadly sin and after due penance obtain absolution but i knew bridget of old and felt that she was a penitent sent to me i went through those holy offices appointed by our church for the relief of such a case i was the more bound to do this as i found that she had come to antwerp for the sole purpose of discovering me and making confession to me of the nature of that fearful confession i am forbidden to speak much of it you know possibly all it now remains for her to free herself from mortal guilt and to set others free from the consequences thereof no prayers no masses will ever do it although they may strengthen her with that strength by which alone acts of deepest love and purest self-devotion may be performed her words of passion and cries for revenge her unholy prayers could never reach the ears of the holy saints other powers intercepted them and wrought so that the curses thrown up to heaven have fallen on her own flesh and blood and so through her very strength of love have bruised and crushed her heart henceforward her former self must be buried yea buried quick if need be but never more to make sign or utter cry on earth she has become a poor clare in order that by perpetual penance and constant service of others she may at length so act as to obtain final absolution and rest for her soul until then the innocent must suffer it is to plead for the innocent that i come to you not in the name of the witch bridget fitzgerald but of the penitent and servant of all men the poor clare sister magdalen sir said i i listen to your request with respect only i may tell you it is not needed to urge me to do all that i can on behalf of one love for whom is part of my very life if for a time i have absented myself from her it is to think and work for her redemption i a member of the english church my uncle a puritan pray morning and night for her by name the congregations of london on the next sabbath will pray for one unknown that she may be set free from the powers of darkness moreover i must tell you sir that those evil ones touch not the great calm of her soul she lives her own pure and loving life unharmed and untainted though all men fall off from her i would i could have her faith my uncle now spoke nephew said he it seems to me that this gentleman although professing what i consider an erroneous creed has touched upon the right point in exhorting bridget to acts of love and mercy whereby to wipe out her sin of hate and vengeance let us strive after our fashion by almsgiving and visiting of the needy and fatherless to make our prayers acceptable meanwhile i myself will go down into the north and take charge of the maiden i am too old to be daunted by man or demon i will bring her to this house as to a home and let the double come if it will a company of godly divines shall give it the meeting and we will try issue the kindly brave old man but father bernard sat on musing all hate said he cannot be quenched in her heart all christian forgiveness cannot have entered into her soul or the demon would have lost its power you said i think that her grandchild was still tormented still tormented i replied sadly thinking of mistress clark's last letter he rose to go we afterwards heard that the occasion of his coming to london was a secret political mission on behalf of the jacobites nevertheless he was a good and wise man months and months passed away without any change lucy entreated my uncle to leave her where she was dreading as i learnt lest if she came with her fearful companion to dwell in the same house with me that my love could not stand the repeated shocks to which i should be doomed 
and this she thought from no distrust of the strength of my affection but from a kind of pitying sympathy for the terror to the nerves which she observed that the demoniac visitation caused in all i was restless and miserable i devoted myself to good works but i performed them from no spirit of love but solely from the hope of reward and payment and so the reward was never granted at length i asked my uncle's leave to travel and i went forth a wanderer with no distincter end than that of many another wanderer to get away from myself a strange impulse led me to antwerp in spite of the wars and commotions then raging in the low countries or rather perhaps the very craving to become interested in something external led me to the thick of the struggle then going on with the austrians the cities of flanders were all full at that time of civil disturbances and rebellions only kept down by force and the presence of an austrian garrison in every place i arrived in antwerp and made inquiry for father bernard he was away in the country for a day or two then i asked my way to the convent of poor clares but being healthy and prosperous i could only see the dim pent-up grey walls shut closely in by narrow streets in the lowest part of the town my landlord told me that had i been stricken by some loathsome disease or in desperate case of any kind the poor clares would have taken me and tended me he spoke of them as an order of mercy of the strictest kind dressing scantily in the coarsest materials going barefoot living on what the inhabitants of antwerp chose to bestow and sharing even those fragments and crumbs with the poor and helpless that swarmed all around receiving no letters or communication with the outer world utterly dead to everything but the alleviation of suffering he smiled at my inquiring whether i could get speech of one of them and told me that they were even forbidden to speak for the purposes of begging their daily food while yet they lived and fed others upon what was given in charity but exclaimed i supposing all men forgot them would they quietly lie down and die without making sign of their extremity if such were their rule the poor clares would willingly do it but their founder appointed a remedy for such extreme cases as you suggest they have a bell tis but a small one as i have heard that has yet never been rung in the memory of man when the poor clares have been without food for twenty-four hours they may ring this bell and then trust to our good people of antwerp for rushing to the rescue of the poor clares who have taken such blessed care of us in all our straits it seemed to me that such rescue would be late in the day but i did not say what i thought i rather turned the conversation by asking my landlord if he knew or had ever heard anything of a certain sister magdalen yes said he rather under his breath news will creep out even from a convent of poor clares sister magdalen is either a great sinner or a great saint she does more as i have heard than all the other nuns put together yet when last month they would fain have made her mother superior she begged rather that they would place her below all the rest and make her the meanest servant of all you never saw her asked i never he replied i was weary of waiting for father bernard and yet i lingered in antwerp the political state of things became worse than ever increased to its height by the scarcity of food consequent on many deficient harvests i saw groups of fierce squalid men at every corner of the street glaring out with wolfish eyes at my sleek skin and handsome clothes at last father bernard returned we had a long conversation in which he told me that curiously enough mr gisborne lucy's father was serving in one of the austrian regiments then in garrison at antwerp i asked father bernard if he would make us acquainted which he consented to do but a day or two afterwards he told me that on hearing my name 
mr gisborne had declined responding to any advances on my part saying he had abjured his country and hated his countrymen probably he recollected my name in connection with that of his daughter lucy anyhow it was clear enough that i had no chance of making his acquaintance father bernard confirmed me in my suspicions of the hidden fermentation for some coming evil working among the blouses of antwerp and he would fain have had me depart from out the city but i rather craved the excitement of danger and stubbornly refused to leave one day when i was walking with him in the place Verte, he bowed to an austrian officer who was crossing towards the cathedral that is mr gisborne said he as soon as the gentleman was passed i turned to look at the tall slight figure of the officer he carried himself in a stately manner although he was past middle age and from his years might have had some excuse for a slight stoop as i looked at the man he turned round his eyes met mine and i saw his face deeply lined sallow and scathed was that countenance scarred by passion as well as by the fortunes of war twas but a moment our eyes met we each turned round and went on our separate way but his whole appearance was not one to be easily forgotten the thorough appointment of the dress and evident thought bestowed on it made but an incongruous whole with the dark gloomy expression of his countenance because he was lucy's father i sought instinctively to meet him everywhere at last he must have become aware of my pertinacity for he gave me a haughty scowl whenever i passed him in one of these encounters however i chanced to be of some service to him he was turning the corner of a street and came suddenly on one of the groups of discontented flemings of whom i have spoken some words were exchanged when my gentleman out with his sword and with a slight but skilful cut drew blood from one of those who had insulted him as he fancied though i was too far off to hear the words they would all have fallen upon him had i not rushed forward and raised the cry then well known in antwerp of rally to the austrian soldiers who were perpetually patrolling the streets and who came in numbers to the rescue i think that neither mr gisborne nor the mutinous group of plebeians owed me much gratitude for my interference he had planted himself against a wall in a skilful attitude of fence ready with his bright glancing rapier to do battle with all the heavy fierce unarmed men some six or seven in number but when his own soldiers came up he sheathed his sword and giving some careless word of command sent them away again and continued his saunter all alone down the street the workmen snarling in his rear and more than half inclined to fall on me for my cry of rescue i cared not if they did my life seemed so dreary a burden just then and perhaps it was this daring loitering among them that prevented their attacking me instead they suffered me to fall into conversation with them and i heard some of their grievances sore and heavy to be borne were they and no wonder the sufferers were savage and desperate the man whom gisborne had wounded across his face would fain have got out of me the name of his aggressor but i refused to tell it another of the group heard his inquiry and made answer i know the man he is one gisborne aide-de-camp to the general commandant i know him well he began to tell some story in connection with gisborne in a low and muttering voice and while he was relating a tale which i saw excited their evil blood and which they evidently wished me not to hear i sauntered away and back to my lodgings that night antwerp was in open revolt the inhabitants rose in rebellion against their austrian masters the austrians holding the gates of the city remained at first pretty quiet in the citadel only from time to time the boom of a great cannon swept sullenly over the town but if they expected the disturbance to die away and spend itself in a few hours fury they were mistaken 
in a day or two the rioters held possession of the principal municipal buildings then the austrians poured forth in bright flaming array calm and smiling as they marched to the posts assigned as if the fierce mob were no more to them than the swarms of buzzing summer flies their practised manoeuvres their well-aimed shot told with terrible effect but in the place of one slain rioter three sprang up of his blood to avenge his loss but a deadly foe a ghastly ally of the austrians was at work food scarce and dear for months was now hardly to be obtained at any price desperate efforts were being made to bring provisions into the city for the rioters had friends without close to the city port nearest to the scheldt a great struggle took place i was there helping the rioters whose cause i had adopted we had a savage encounter with the austrians numbers fell on both sides i saw them lie bleeding for a moment then a volley of smoke obscured them and when it cleared away they were dead trampled upon or smothered pressed down and hidden by the freshly wounded whom those last guns had brought low and then a grey-robed and grey-veiled figure came right across the flashing guns and stooped over some one whose life-blood was ebbing away sometimes it was to give him drink from some cans which they carried slung at their sides sometimes i saw the cross held above a dying man and rapid prayers were being uttered unheard by men in that hellish din and clangour but listened to by one above i saw all this as in a dream the reality of that stern time was battle and carnage but i knew that these grey figures their bare feet all wet with blood and their faces hidden by their veils were the poor clares sent forth now because dire agony was abroad and imminent danger at hand therefore they left their cloistered shelter and came into that thick and evil melee close to me driven past me by the struggle of many fighters came the antwerp burgess with the scarce healed scar upon his face and in an instant more he was thrown by the press upon the austrian officer gisborne and ere either had recovered the shock the burgess had recognized his opponent ha the englishman gisborne he cried and threw himself upon him with redoubled fury he had struck him hard the englishman was down when out of the smoke came a dark grey figure and threw herself right under the uplifted flashing sword the burgess's arm stood arrested neither austrians nor anversois willingly harmed the poor clares leave him to me said a low stern voice he is mine enemy mine for many years those words were the last i heard i myself was struck down by a bullet i remember nothing more for days when i came to myself i was at the extremity of weakness and was craving for food to recruit my strength my landlord sat watching me he too looked pinched and shrunken he had heard of my wounded state and sought me out yes the struggle still continued but the famine was sore and some he had heard had died for lack of food the tears stood in his eyes as he spoke but soon he shook off his weakness and his natural cheerfulness returned father bernard would come back that afternoon he had promised but father bernard never came although i was up and dressed and looking eagerly for him my landlord brought me a meal which he had cooked himself of what it was composed he would not say but it was most excellent and with every mouthful i seemed to gain strength the good man sat looking at my evident enjoyment with a happy smile of sympathy but as my appetite became satisfied i began to detect a certain wistfulness in his eyes as if craving for the food i had so nearly devoured for indeed at that time i was hardly aware of the extent of the famine suddenly there was a sound of many rushing feet past our window my landlord opened one of the sides of it the better to learn what was going on then we heard a faint cracked tinkling bell coming shrill upon the air clear and distinct from all other sounds 
holy mother exclaimed the landlord the poor clares he snatched up the fragments of my meal and crammed them into my hands bidding me follow downstairs he ran clutching at more food as the woman of his house eagerly held it out to him and in a moment we were in the street moving along with the great current all tending towards the convent of the poor clares and still as if piercing our ears with its inarticulate cry came the shrill tinkle of the bell in that strange crowd were old men trembling and sobbing as they carried their little pittance of food women with the tears running down their cheeks who had snatched up what provisions they had in the vessels in which they stood so that the burden of these was in many cases much greater than that which they contained children with flushed faces grasping tight the morsel of bitten cake or bread in their eagerness to carry it safe to the help of the poor clares strong men yea both anversois and austrians pressing onward with set teeth and no word spoken and over all and through all came that sharp tinkle that cry for help in extremity we met the first torrent of people returning with blanched and piteous faces they were issuing out of the convent to make way for the offerings of others haste haste said they a poor clare is dying a poor clare is dead for hunger god forgive us and our city we pressed on the stream bore us along where it would we were carried through refectories bare and crumbless into the cells over whose doors the conventual name of the occupant was written thus it was that i with others was forced into sister magdalen's cell on her couch lay gisborne pale unto death but not dead by his side was a cup of water and a small morsel of mouldy bread which he had pushed out of his reach and could not move to obtain over against his bed were these words copied in the english version therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink some of us gave him of our food and left him eating greedily like some famished wild animal for now it was no longer the sharp tinkle but that one solemn toll which in all christian countries tells of the passing of the spirit out of earthly life into eternity and again a murmur gathered and grew as of many people speaking with awed breath a poor clare is dying a poor clare is dead borne along once more by the motion of the crowd we were carried into the chapel belonging to the poor clares on a bier before the high altar lay a woman lay sister magdalen lay bridget fitzgerald by her side stood father bernard in his robes of office and holding the crucifix on high while he pronounced the solemn absolution of the church as to one who had newly confessed herself of deadly sin i pushed on with passionate force till i stood close to the dying woman as she received extreme unction amid the breathless and awed hush of the multitude around her eyes were glazing her limbs were stiffening but when the rite was over and finished she raised her gaunt figure slowly up and her eyes brightened to a strange intensity of joy as with the gesture of her finger and the trance-like gleam of her eye she seemed like one who watched the disappearance of some loathed and fearful creature she is freed from the curse said she as she fell back dead now of all our party who at first listened to my lady ludlow mr preston was the only one who had not told us something either of information tradition history or legend we naturally turned to him but we did not like asking him directly for his contribution for he was a grave reserved and silent man he understood us however and rousing himself as it were he said i know you wish me to tell you in my turn of something which i have learnt or heard during my life i could tell you something of my own life and of a life dearer still to my memory 
but i have shrunk from narrating anything so purely personal yet shrink as i will no other but those sad recollections will present themselves to my mind i call them sad when i think of the end of it all however i am not going to moralize if my dear brother's life and death does not speak for itself no words of mine will teach you what may be learnt from it End of the Poor Clare The Half Brothers My mother was twice married. She never spoke of her first husband, and it is only from other people that I have learnt what little I know about him. I believe she was scarcely seventeen when she was married to him, and he was barely one and twenty. He rented a small farm up in Cumberland, somewhere towards the sea-coast, but he was perhaps too young and inexperienced to have the charge of land and cattle. Anyhow, his affairs did not prosper, and he fell into ill health and died of consumption before they had been three years man and wife, leaving my mother a young widow of twenty with a little child only just able to walk, and the farm on her hands for four years more by the lease with half the stock on it dead, or sold off one by one to pay the more pressing debts, and with no money to purchase more, or even to buy the provisions needed for the small consumption of every day. There was another child coming too, and sad and sorry I believe she was to think of it. A dreary winter she must have had in her lonesome dwelling, with never another near it for miles around. Her sister came to bear her company, and they too planned and plotted how to make every penny they could raise go as far as possible. I can't tell you how it happened that my little sister, whom I never saw, came to sicken and die. But, as if my poor mother's cup was not full enough, only a fortnight before Gregory was born, the little girl took ill of scarlet fever, and in a week she lay dead. My mother was, I believe, just stunned with this last blow my aunt has told me that she did not cry aunt fanny would have been thankful if she had but she sat holding the poor wee lassie's hand and looking in her pretty pale dead face without so much as shedding a tear and it was all the same when they had to take her away to be buried she just kissed the child and sat her down in the window seat to watch the little black train of people neighbours, my aunt, and one far-off cousin, who were all the friends they could muster, go winding away among the snow which had fallen thinly over the country the night before. When my aunt came back from the funeral, she found my mother in the same place, and as dry-eyed as ever. So she continued, until after Gregory was born, and, somehow, his coming seemed to loosen the tears, and she cried day and night day and night till my aunt and the other watcher looked at each other with dismay and would fain have stopped her if they had but known how but she bade them let her alone and not be over anxious for every drop she shed eased her brain which had been in a terrible state before for want of the power to cry she seemed after that to think of nothing but her new little baby she hardly appeared to remember either her husband or her little daughter that lay dead in bringham churchyard at least so aunt fanny said but she was a great talker and my mother was very silent by nature and i think aunt fanny may have been mistaken in believing that my mother never thought of her husband and child just because she never spoke about them Aunt Fanny was older than my mother, and had a way of treating her like a child, but for all that she was a kind, warm-hearted creature who thought more of her sister's welfare than she did of her own, and it was on her bit of money that they principally lived, and on what the two could earn by working for the great Glasgow sewing merchants. But, by and by, my mother's eyesight began to fail, it was not that she was exactly blind for she could see well enough to guide herself about the house and to do a good deal of domestic work but she could no longer do fine sewing and earn money 
it must have been with the heavy crying she had had in her day for she was but a young creature at this time and as pretty a young woman i have heard people say as any on the countryside she took it sadly to heart that she could no longer gain anything towards the keep of herself and her child my aunt fanny would fain have persuaded her that she had enough to do in managing their cottage and minding gregory but my mother knew that they were pinched and that aunt fanny herself had not as much to eat even of the commonest kind of food as she could have done with and as for gregory he was not a strong lad and needed not more food for he always had enough whoever went short but better nourishment and more flesh meat one day it was aunt fanny who told me all this about my poor mother long after her death as the sisters were sitting together aunt fanny working and my mother hushing gregory to sleep william preston who was afterwards my father came in he was reckoned an old bachelor i suppose he was long past forty and he was one of the wealthiest farmers thereabouts and had known my grandfather well and my mother and my aunt in their more prosperous days he sat down and began to twirl his hat by way of being agreeable my aunt fanny talked and he listened and looked at my mother but he said very little either on that visit or on many another that he paid before he spoke out what had been the real purpose of his calling so often all along and from the very first time he came to their house one sunday however my aunt fanny stayed away from church and took care of the child and my mother went alone when she came back she ran straight upstairs without going into the kitchen to look at gregory or to speak any word to her sister and aunt fanny heard her cry as if her heart was breaking so she went up and scolded her right well through the bolted door till at last she got her to open it and then she threw herself on my aunt's neck and told her that william preston had asked her to marry him and had promised to take good charge of her boy and to let him want for nothing neither in the way of keep nor of education and that she had consented aunt fanny was a good deal shocked at this for as i have said she had often thought that my mother had forgotten her first husband very quickly and now here was proof positive of it if she could so soon think of marrying again besides as aunt fanny used to say she herself would have been a far more suitable match for a man of william breston's age than helen who though she was a widow had not seen her four-and-twentieth summer however as aunt fanny said they had not asked her advice and there was much to be said on the other side of the question helen's eyesight would never be good for much again and as william preston's wife she would never need to do anything if she chose to sit with her hands before her and a boy was a great charge to a widowed mother and now there would be a decent steady man to see after him so by and by aunt fanny seemed to take a brighter view of the marriage than did my mother herself who hardly ever looked up and never smiled after the day when she promised william preston to be his wife but much as she had loved gregory before she seemed to love him more now she was continually talking to him when they were alone though he was far too young to understand her moaning words or give her any comfort except by his caresses at last william preston and she were wed and she went to be mistress of a well-stocked house not above half an hour's walk from where aunt fanny lived i believe she did all that she could to please my father and a more dutiful wife i have heard him himself say could never have been but she did not love him and he soon found it out she loved gregory and she did not love him perhaps love would have come in time if he had been patient enough to wait but it just turned him sour to see how her eye brightened and her colour came at the sight of that little child while for him who had given her so much she had only gentle words as cold as ice he got to taunt her with the difference in her manner as if that would bring love and he took a positive dislike to gregory he was so jealous of the ready love that always gushed out like a spring of fresh water when he came near 
he wanted her to love him more and perhaps that was all well and good but he wanted her to love her child less and that was an evil wish one day he gave way to his temper and cursed and swore at gregory who had got into some mischief as children will my mother made some excuse for him my father said it was hard enough to have to keep another man's child without having it perpetually held up in its naughtiness by his wife who ought to be always in the same mind that he was and so from little they got to more and the end of it was that my mother took to her bed before her time and i was born that very day my father was glad and proud and sorry all in a breath glad and proud that a son was born to him and sorry for his poor wife's state and to think how his angry words had brought it on but he was a man who liked better to be angry than sorry so he soon found out that it was all gregory's fault and owed him an additional grudge for having hastened my birth he had another grudge against him before long my mother began to sink the day after i was born my father sent to carlisle for doctors and would have coined his heart's blood into gold to save her if that could have been but it could not my aunt fanny used to say sometimes that she thought that helen did not wish to live and so just let herself die away without trying to take hold on life but when i questioned her she owned that my mother did all the doctors bade her do with the same sort of uncomplaining patience with which she had acted through life one of her last requests was to have gregory laid in her bed by my side and then she made him take hold of my little hand her husband came in while she was looking at us so and when he bent tenderly over her to ask how she felt now and seemed to gaze on us two little half-brothers with a grave sort of kindliness she looked up into his face and smiled almost her first smile at him and such a sweet smile as more besides aunt fanny have said in an hour she was dead aunt fanny came to live with us it was the best thing that could be done my father would have been glad to return to his old mode of bachelor life but what could he do with two little children he needed a woman to take care of him and who so fitting as his wife's elder sister so she had the charge of me from my birth and for a time i was weakly as was but natural and she was always beside me night and day watching over me and my father nearly as anxious as she for his land had come down from father to son for more than three hundred years and he would have cared for me merely as his flesh and blood that was to inherit the land after him but he needed something to love for all that to most people he was a stern hard man and he took to me as i fancy he had taken to no human being before as he might have taken to my mother if she had had no former life for him to be jealous of i loved him back again right heartily i loved all around me i believe for everybody was kind to me after a time i overcame my original weakliness of constitution and was just a bonny strong-looking lad whom every passer-by noticed when my father took me with him to the nearest town at home i was the darling of my aunt the tenderly beloved of my father the pet and plaything of the old domestic the young master of the farm labourers before whom i played many a lordly antic assuming a sort of authority which sat oddly enough i doubt not on such a baby as i was gregory was three years older than i aunt fanny was always kind to him in deed and in action but she did not often think about him she had fallen so completely into the habit of being engrossed by me from the fact of my having come into her charge as a delicate baby my father never got over his grudging dislike of his stepson who had so innocently wrestled with him for the possession of my mother's heart i mistrust me too that my father always considered him as the cause of my mother's death and my early delicacy and utterly unreasonable as this may seem i believe my father rather cherished his feeling of alienation to my brother as a duty than strove to repress it yet not for the world would my father have grudged him anything that money could purchase that was as it were in the bond when he had wedded my mother gregory was lumpish and loutish 
awkward and ungainly, marring whatever he meddled in, and many a hard word and sharp scolding did he get from the people about the farm, who hardly waited till my father's back was turned before they rated the stepson. I am ashamed. My heart is sore to think how I fell into the fashion of the family and slighted my poor orphan stepbrother. I don't think I ever scouted him or was wilfully ill-natured to him, but the habit of being considered in all things and being treated as something uncommon and superior made me insolent in my prosperity, and I exacted more than Gregory was always willing to grant, and then, irritated, I sometimes repeated the disparaging words I had heard others use with regard to him without fully understanding their meaning. Whether he did or not, I cannot tell. I am afraid he did. He used to turn silent and quiet. Sullen and sulky, my father thought it. Stupid, Aunt Fanny used to call it. But everyone said he was stupid and dull, and this stupidity and dullness grew upon him. He would sit without speaking a word sometimes for hours. Then my father would bid him rise and do some piece of work, maybe, about the farm. And he would take three or four tellings before he would go. When we were sent to school, it was all the same. He could never be made to remember his lessons. The schoolmaster grew weary of scolding and flogging, and at last advised my father just to take him away, and set him to some farm work that might not be above his comprehension. I think he was more gloomy and stupid than ever after this. Yet he was not a cross lad. He was patient and good-natured, and would try to do a kind turn for any one, even if they had been scolding or cuffing him not a minute before. But very often his attempts at kindness ended in some mischief to the very people he was trying to serve, owing to his awkward, ungainly ways. I suppose I was a clever lad. At any rate, I always got plenty of praise, and was, as we call it, the cock of the school. The schoolmaster said I could learn anything I chose. But my father, who had no great learning himself, saw little use in much for me, and took me away betimes and kept me with him about the farm. Gregory was made into a kind of shepherd, receiving his training under old Adam, who was nearly past his work. I think old Adam was almost the first person who had a good opinion of Gregory. He stood to it that my brother had good parts, though he did not rightly know how to bring them out and for knowing the bearings of the fells he said he had never seen a lad like him my father would try to bring adam round to speak of gregory's faults and shortcomings but instead of that he would praise him twice as much as soon as he found out what my father's object was one winter time when i was about sixteen and gregory nineteen i was sent by my father on an errand to a place about seven miles distant by the road but only about four by the fells. He bade me return by the road, whichever way I took in going, for the evenings closed in early, and were often thick and misty. Besides which, old Adam, now paralytic and bedridden, foretold a downfall of snow before long. I soon got to my journey's end, and soon had done my business, earlier by an hour i thought than my father had expected so i took the decision of the way by which i should return into my own hands and set off back again over the fells just as the first shades of evening began to fall it looked dark and gloomy enough but everything was so still that i thought i should have plenty of time to get home before the snow came down off i set at a pretty quick pace but night came on quicker the right path was clear enough in the daytime, although at several points two or three exactly similar diverged from the same place. But when there was a good light, the traveller was guided by the sight of distant objects, a piece of rock, a fall in the ground, which were quite invisible to me now. I plucked up a brave heart, however, and took what seemed to me the right road. It was wrong, however and led me whither I knew not, but to some wild boggy moor, where the solitude seemed painful, intense, as if never footfall of man had come thither to break the silence. I tried to shout, with the dimmest possible hope of being heard, rather to reassure myself by the sound of my own voice. But my voice came husky and short. 
and yet it dismayed me it seemed so weird and strange in that noiseless expanse of black darkness suddenly the air was filled thick with dusky flakes my face and hands were wet with snow it cut me off from the slightest knowledge of where i was for i lost every idea of the direction from which i had come so that i could not even retrace my steps it hemmed me in thicker thicker with a darkness that might be felt the boggy soil on which i stood quaked under me if i remained long in one place and yet i dared not move far all my youthful hardiness seemed to leave me at once i was on the point of crying and only very shame seemed to keep it down to save myself from shedding tears i shouted terrible wild shouts for bare life they were i turned sick as i paused to listen no answering sound came but the unfeeling echoes only the noiseless pitiless snow kept falling thicker thicker faster faster i was growing numb and sleepy i tried to move about but i dared not go far for fear of the precipices which i knew abounded in certain places on the fells now and then i stood still and shouted again but my voice was getting choked with tears as i thought of the desolate helpless death i was to die and how little they at home sitting around the warm red bright fire wondered what was become of me and how my poor father would grieve for me it would surely kill him it would break his heart poor old man aunt fanny too was this to be the end of all her cares for me i began to review my life in a strange kind of vivid dream in which the various scenes of my few boyish years passed before me like visions in a pang of agony caused by such remembrance of my short life i gathered up my strength and called out once more a long despairing wailing cry to which i had no hope of obtaining any answer save from the echoes around dulled as the sound might be by the thickened air to my surprise i heard a cry almost as long as wild as mine so wild that it seemed unearthly and i almost thought it must be the voice of some of the mocking spirits of the fells about whom i had heard so many tales my heart suddenly began to beat fast and loud i could not reply for a minute or two i nearly fancied i had lost the power of utterance just at this moment a dog barked was it lassie's bark my brother's collie an ugly enough brute with a white ill-looking face that my father always kicked whenever he saw it partly for its own demerits partly because it belonged to my brother on such occasions gregory would whistle lassie away and go off and sit with her in some outhouse my father had once or twice been ashamed of himself when the poor collie had yowled out with the suddenness of the pain and had relieved himself of his self-reproach by blaming my brother who he said had no notion of training a dog and was enough to ruin any collie in christendom with his stupid way of allowing them to lie by the kitchen fire to all which gregory would answer nothing nor even seem to hear but go on looking absent and moody yes there again it was lassie's bark now or never i lifted up my voice and shouted lassie lassie for god's sake lassie another moment and the great white-faced lassie was curving and gambling with delight around my feet and legs looking however up in my face with her intelligent apprehensive eyes as if fearing lest i might greet her with a blow as i had done oftentimes before but i cried with gladness as i stooped down and patted her my mind was sharing in my body's weakness and i could not reason but i knew that help was at hand a grey figure came more and more distinctly out of the thick close pressing darkness it was gregory wrapped in his maud oh gregory said i and fell upon his neck unable to speak another word he never spoke much and made me no answer for some little time then he told me we must move we must walk for the dear life we must find our road home if possible but we must move or we should be frozen to death 
don't you know the way home asked i i thought i did when i set out but i am doubtful now the snow blinds me and i am feared that in moving about just now i have lost the right gait homewards he had his shepherd's staff with him and by dint of plunging it before us at every step we took clinging close to each other we went on safely enough as far as not falling down any of the steep rocks but it was slow dreary work my brother i saw was more guided by lassie and the way she took than anything else trusting to her instinct it was too dark to see far before us but he called her back continually and noted from what quarter she returned and shaped our slow steps accordingly but the tedious motion scarcely kept my very blood from freezing every bone every fibre in my body seemed first to ache and then to swell and then to turn numb with the intense cold my brother bore it better than i from having been more out upon the hills he did not speak except to call lassie i strove to be brave and not complain but now i felt the deadly fatal sleep stealing over me i can go no farther i said in a drowsy tone i remember i suddenly became dogged and resolved sleep i would were it only for five minutes if death were to be the consequence sleep i would gregory stood still i suppose he recognized the peculiar phase of suffering to which i had been brought by the cold it is of no use said he as if to himself we are no nearer home than we were when we started as far as i can tell our only chance is in lassie here roll thee in my maud lad and lay thee down on this sheltered side of this bit of rock creep close under it lad and i'll lie by thee and strive to keep the warmth in us stay hast gotten aught about thee they'll know at home i felt him unkind thus to keep me from slumber but on his repeating the question i pulled out my pocket handkerchief of some showy pattern which aunt fanny had hemmed for me gregory took it and tied it around lassie's neck hie thee lassie hie thee home and the white-faced ill-favoured brute was off like a shot in the darkness now i might lie down now i might sleep in my drowsy stupor i felt that i was being tenderly covered up by my brother but what with i neither knew nor cared i was too dull too selfish too numb to think and reason or i might have known that in that bleak bare place there was naught to wrap me in save what was taken off another i was glad enough when he ceased his cares and lay down by me i took his hand thou canst not remember lad how we lay together thus by our dying mother she put thy small wee hand in mine i reckon she sees us now and belike we shall soon be with her anyhow god's will be done dear gregory i muttered and crept nearer to him for warmth he was talking still and again about our mother when i fell asleep in an instant or so it seemed there were many voices about me many faces hovering round me the sweet luxury of warmth was stealing into every part of me i was in my own little bed at home i am thankful to say my first word was gregory a look passed from one to another my father's stern old face strove in vain to keep its sternness his mouth quivered his eyes filled slowly with unwanted tears i would have given him half my land i would have blessed him as my son o oh god i would have knelt at his feet and asked him to forgive my hardness of heart i heard no more a whirl came through my brain catching me back to death i came slowly to my consciousness weeks afterwards my father's hair was white when i recovered and his hands shook as he looked into my face we spoke no more of gregory we could not speak of him but he was strangely in our thoughts lassie came and went with never a word of blame nay my father would try to stroke her but she shrank away and he as if reproved by the poor dumb beast would sigh and be silent and abstracted for a time aunt fanny always a talker told me all 
how on that fatal night my father irritated by my prolonged absence and probably more anxious than he cared to show had been fierce and imperious even beyond his wont to gregory had upbraided him with his father's poverty his own stupidity which made his services good for nothing for so in spite of the old shepherd my father always chose to consider them at last gregory had risen up and whistled lassie out with him poor lassie crouching underneath his chair for fear of a kick or a blow some time before there had been some talk between my father and my aunt respecting my return and when aunt fanny told me all this she said she fancied that gregory might have noticed the coming storm and gone out silently to meet me three hours afterwards when all were running about in wild alarm not knowing whither to go in search of me not even missing gregory or heeding his absence poor fellow poor poor fellow lassie came home with my handkerchief tied round her neck they knew and understood and the whole strength of the farm was turned out to follow her with wraps and blankets and brandy and everything that could be thought of i lay in chilly sleep but still alive beneath the rock that lassie guided them to i was covered over with my brother's plaid and his thick shepherd's coat was carefully wrapped round my feet he was in his shirt-sleeves his arm thrown over me a quiet smile he had hardly ever smiled in life upon his still cold face my father's last words were god forgive me my hardness of heart towards the fatherless child and what marked the depth of his feeling of repentance perhaps more than all considering the passionate love he bore my mother was this we found a paper of directions after his death in which he desired that he might lie at the foot of the grave in which by his desire poor gregory had been laid with our mother end of the half brothers and end of round the sofa by elizabeth gaskell